Good evening, class. Thank you for joining me tonight as we continue reading The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I'm going to just give it a minute for people to arrive. In the meantime, please enjoy the relaxing Chopin playlist that I've got on in the background. I hope you're all keeping cool if you're in the midst of a heat wave as I am. Do settle in class, because it should be a nice, relaxing stream. I think we should get through two or three stories tonight, beginning with The Man with the Twisted Lip. Sound alerts doesn't appear to be working, but that's fine. Don't need to leave that up in chat. There we are. So for those of you joining for the first time, thank you very much. My name is Professor Bloom. And tonight, I'll be reading to you from The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Doesn't matter if you haven't heard the previous stories. They're short stories for a reason. They're self-contained, entertaining little mysteries. All told from the perspective of John Watson, Holmes's erstwhile assistant. And this is the man with the twisted lip. If the background music is too loud, do let me know and I can turn it down a little bit. Hello, kitty. My cat is using my chair as a scratching post. I do wish you would. Yes. Sorry, cat management is often a part of the class here. All right. Why don't we begin then? Oh, my online. My bit rate's low, but I do appear to be live. So, let us get started. The man with the twisted lip. Isa Whitney, brother of the late Elias Whitney, Doctor of Divinity, principal of the Theological College of St. George's, was much addicted to opium. The habit grew upon him, as I understand, from some foolish freak when he was at college, for having read De Quincey's description of his dreams and sensations, he had drenched his tobacco with laudanum in an attempt to produce the same effects. Oh, thank you for the raid, Atropa. This is perfect timing, as it happens. I was just beginning to read. So, welcome, viewers. How did the rest of your calligraphy stream go? I had to duck out to prepare myself here. Any choice quotes? All right. Well, as I had only just begun, I'll start over. So, class, welcome back to the continuing adventures of Sherlock Holmes. This is The Man with the Twisted Lip. Isa Whitney, brother of the late Elias Whitney, Doctor of Divinity, principal of the Theological College of St. George's, was much addicted to opium. The habit grew upon him, as I understand, from some foolish freak when he was at college. For having read De Quincey's description of his dreams and sensations, he had drenched his tobacco with laudanum in an attempt to produce the same effects. He found, as so many more have done, that the practice is easier to attain than to get rid of, and for many years he continued to be a slave to the drug, an object of mingled horror and pity to his friends and relatives. I can see him now, with yellow, pasty face, drooping lids and pinpoint pupils, all huddled in a chair, the wreck and ruin of a noble man. One night, it was in June, 89, there came a ring to my bell, 
about the hour when a man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock. I sat up in my chair, and my wife laid her needlework down in her lap and made a little face of disappointment. A patient, said she. You'll have to go out. I groaned, for I was newly come back from a weary day. We heard the door open, a few hurried words, and then quick steps upon the linoleum. Our own door flew open, and a lady, clad in some dark-colored stuff with a black veil, entered the room. You will excuse my calling so late, she began, and then suddenly losing her self-control, she ran forward, threw her arms around my wife's neck, and sobbed upon her shoulder. Oh, I am in such trouble, she cried. I do so want a little help. Why, said my wife, pulling up her veil, it is Kate Whitney. How you've startled me, Kate. I had not an idea who you were when you came in. I didn't know what to do, so I came straight to you. That was always the way. Folks who were in grief came to my wife like birds to a lighthouse. It was very sweet of you to come. Now you must have some wine and water and sit here comfortably and tell us all about it. Or should you rather that I sent James off to bed? Oh, no, no, I want the doctor's advice and help too. It's about Isa. He's not been home for two days. I'm so frightened about him. It was not the first time that she had spoken to us of her husband's trouble. To me as a doctor, to my wife as an old friend and school companion. We soothed and comforted her by such words as we could find. Did she know where her husband was? Was it possible that we could bring him back to her? It seems that it was. She had the surest information that of late he had, when the fit was on him, made use of an opium den in the farthest east of the city. Hitherto his orgies had always been confined to one day, and he had come back, twitching and shattered, in the evening. But now the spell had been upon him eight and forty hours, and he lay there, doubtless among the dregs of the docks, breathing in the poison or sleeping off the effects. There he was to be found, she was sure of it, at the Bar of Gold in Upper Swandom Lane. But what was she to do? How could she, a young and timid woman, make her way into such a place and pluck her husband out from among the ruffians who surrounded him? There was the case, and of course there was but one way out of it. Might I not escort her to this place? And then, as a second thought, why should she come at all? I was Isa Whitney's medical advisor, and as such, I had influence over him. I could manage it better if I were alone. I promised her on my word that I would send him home in a cab within two hours if he were indeed at the address which she had given me. And so in ten minutes I had left my armchair and cheery sitting room behind me, and was speeding eastward in a hansom on a strange errand, as it seemed to me at the time, though the future only could show how strange it was to be. But there was no great difficulty in the first stage of my adventure. Upper Swandham Lane is a vile alley lurking behind the high wharves which line the north side of the river to the east of London Bridge. Between a slop shop and a gin shop, approached by a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap like the mouth of a cave, I found the den of which I was in search. Ordering my cab to wait, I passed down the steps, worn a hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of drunken feet, and by the light of a flickering oil lamp above the door, I found the latch, and made my way into a long, low room, thick and heavy with the brown opium smoke, and terraced with wooden birds like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Through the gloom one could dimly catch a glimpse of bodies lying in strange, fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back, and chins pointing upward, with here and there a dark, lackluster eye turned upon the newcomer. Out of the black shadows there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as the burning poison waxed or waned in the bowls of the metal pipes. The most lay silent, but some muttered to themselves, and others talked in a strange, low, monotonous voice, their conversation coming in gushes, and then suddenly tailing off into silence, each mumbling out his own thoughts and paying little heed to the words of his neighbor. At the farther end was a small brazier of burning charcoal, beside which, on a three-legged wooden stool, there sat a tall, thin old man, with his jaw resting upon his two fists and his elbows upon his knees, staring into the fire. As I entered, a sallow Malay attendant had hurried up with a pipe for me and the supply of the drug, beckoning me to an empty berth. "'Thank you. I have not come to stay,' said I. "'There is a friend of mine here, Mr. Isa Whitney.' and I wish to speak with him. 
There was a movement and an exclamation from my right, and peering through the gloom, I saw Whitney, pale, haggard, and unkempt, staring out at me. My god, it's Watson, said he. He was in a pitiable state of reaction, with every nerve in a twitter. I say, Watson, what o'clock is it? Nearly eleven. Of what day? Of Friday, June 19th. Good heavens, I thought it was Wednesday. It is Wednesday. What do you want to frighten a chap for? He sank his face onto his arms and began to sob in a high treble key. I tell you that it is Friday, man. Your wife has been waiting this two days for you. You should be ashamed of yourself. So I am, but you've got mixed, Watson, for I've only been here a few hours. Three pipes, four pipes, forget how many. But I'll go home with you. I wouldn't frighten Kate, poor little Kate. Give me your hand. Have you a cab? Yes, I have one waiting. Then I shall go in it, but I must I must owe something. Find what I owe, Watson. I, I am all off color. I can do nothing for myself. I walked down the narrow passage between the double row of sleepers, holding my breath to keep out the vile, stupefying fumes of the drug, and looking about for the manager. As I passed the tall man who sat by the brazier, I felt a sudden pluck at my skirt, and a low voice whispered, Walk past me, and then look back at me. The words fell quite distinctly upon my ear. I glanced down. They could only have come from the old man at my side, and yet he sat now as absorbed as ever, very thin, very wrinkled, bent with age, an opium pipe dangling down from between his knees as though it had dropped in sheer lassitude from his fingers. I took two steps forward and looked back. It took all my self-control to prevent me from breaking out into a cry of astonishment. He had turned his back so that none could see him but I. His form had filled out, his wrinkles were gone, the dull eyes had regained their fire, and there, sitting by the fire and grinning at my surprise, was none other than Sherlock Holmes. He made a slight motion to me to approach him, and instantly, as he turned his face half round to the company once more, subsided into a doddering, loose-lipped senility. Holmes, I whispered, what on earth are you doing in this den? Slow as you can, he answered. I have excellent ears. If you would have the great kindness to get rid of that sottish friend of yours, I should be exceedingly glad to have a little talk with you. I have a cab outside. Then pray send him home in it. You may safely trust him, for he appears to be too limp to get into any mischief. I should recommend you also send a note by the cabman to your wife, and to say that you have thrown in your lot with me. If you will wait outside, I shall be with you in five minutes. It was difficult to refuse any of Sherlock Holmes's requests, for they were always so exceedingly definite, and put forward with such a quiet air of mastery. I felt, however, that when Whitney was once confined in the cab, my mission was practically accomplished, and for the rest I could not wish anything better than to be associated with my friend in one of those singular adventures which were the normal condition of his existence. In a few minutes I had written my note, paid Whitney's bill, led him out to the cab, and seen him driven through the darkness. In a very short time, a decrepit figure had emerged from the opium den, and I was walking down the street with Sherlock Holmes. For two streets, he shuffled along with a bent back and an uncertain foot. Then, glancing quickly round, he straightened himself out and burst into a hearty fit of laughter. Ha 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 I suppose, Watson, said he, that you imagine that I have added opium smoking to cocaine injections and all the other little weaknesses on which you have favored me with your medical views. I was certainly surprised to find you there, but not more so than I to find you. I came to find a friend. Ah, and I to find an enemy. An enemy? Yes, one of my natural enemies, or, shall I say, my natural prey. Briefly, Watson, I am in the midst of a very remarkable inquiry, and I have hoped to find a clue in the incoherent ramblings of these sots, if I, as I have done before now. Had I been recognized in that den, my life would not have been worth an hour's purchase, for I have used it before now for my own purposes, and the rascally Lasker who runs it has sworn to have vengeance upon me. There is a trap door at the back of that building, near the corner of Paul's Wharf, which could tell some strange tales of what has passed through it upon the moonless nights. What? You do not mean bodies. Aye, bodies, Watson. We should be rich men if we had a thousand pounds for every poor devil who's been done to death in that den. It is the vilest murder trap on the whole riverside, and I fear that Neville St. Clair has entered it never to leave it more. But our trap should be here. 
he put his two forefingers between his teeth and whistled shrilly, a signal which was answered by a similar whistle from the distance, followed shortly by the rattle of wheels and the clink of horses' hooves. Now, Watson, said Holmes, as a tall dog cart dashed up through the gloom, throwing out two golden tunnels of yellow light from its side lantern. You'll come with me, won't you? If I can be of use. Oh, a trusty comrade is always of use, and a chronicler still more so. My room at the Cedars is a double-bedded one. The Cedars? Yes, that is Mr. St. Clair's house. I am staying there while I conduct the inquiry. Where is it, then? Near Lee, in Kent. We have a seven-mile drive before us. I am all in the dark. Of course you are. You'll know all about it presently. Jump up here. All right, John, we shall not need you. Here's half a crown. Look out for me tomorrow about eleven. Give her her head. So long, then. He flicked the horse with his whip, and we dashed away through the endless succession of somber and deserted streets, which widened gradually, until we were flying across a broad balustraded bridge, with the murky river flowing sluggishly beneath us. Beyond lay another dull wilderness of bricks and mortar, its silence broken only by the heavy, regular footfall of the policemen, or the songs and shouts of some belated party of revelers. A dull rack was drifting slowly across the sky, and a star or two twinkled dimly here and there through the rifts of the clouds. Holmes drove in silence, with his head sunk upon his breast, and the air of a man who was lost in thought. While I sat beside him, curious to learn what this new quest might be which seemed to tax his powers so sorely, and yet afraid to break in upon the current of his thoughts. We had driven several miles, and were beginning to get to the fringe of the belt of suburban villas, when he shook himself, shrugged his shoulders, and lit up his pipe with the air of a man who has satisfied himself that he is acting for the best. "'You have a grand gift of silence, Watson,' said he. "'It makes you quite invaluable as a companion. On my word, it is a great thing for me to have someone to talk to, for my own thoughts are not over-pleasant. I was wondering what I should say to this dear little woman tonight when she meets me at the door. You forget that I know nothing about it. I shall just have time to tell you the facts of the case before we get to Lee. It seems absurdly simple, and yet somehow I can get nothing to go upon. There's plenty of thread, no doubt, but I can't get the end of it into my hand. Now, I'll state the case clearly and concisely to you, Watson and maybe you can see a spark where all is dark to me. Proceed, then. Some years ago, to be definite, in May 1884, there came to Lee a gentleman, Neville St. Clair by name, who appeared to have plenty of money. He took a large villa, laid out the grounds very nicely, and lived generally in good style. By degrees, he made friends in the neighborhood, and in 1887 he married the daughter of a local brewer, by whom he now has two children. He had no occupation, but was interested in several companies and went into town as a rule in the morning, returning by the 514 from Cannon Street every night. Mr. St. Clair is now 37 years of age, is a man of temperate habits, a good husband, a very affectionate father, and a man who is popular with all who know him. I may add that his whole debts at present moment, as far as we have been able to ascertain, amount to £88.10, shillings, while he has £220 standing to his credit in the Capital and Counties Bank. There is no reason, therefore, to think that money troubles have been weighing upon his mind. Last Monday, Mr. Neville St. Clair went into town rather earlier than usual, remarking before he started that he had two important commissions to perform, and that he would bring his little boy home a box of bricks. Now, by the merest chance, his wife received a telegram upon this same Monday, very shortly after his departure, to the effect that a small parcel of considerable value which she had been expecting was waiting for her at the offices of the Aberdeen Shipping Company. Now, if you are well up in your London, you will know that the office of the company is in Fresno Street, which branches out of Upper Swandham Lane, where you found me tonight. Mrs. St. Clair had her lunch, started for the city, did some shopping, proceeded to the company's office, got her packet, and found herself at exactly 4.35 walking through Swandham Lane on her way back to the station. Have you followed me so far? It is very clear. If you remember, Monday was an exceedingly hot day, and Mrs. St. Clair walked slowly, glancing about in the hope of seeing a cab, as she did not like the neighborhood in which she found herself. While she was walking in this way down Swandham Lane, she suddenly heard an ejaculation or cry, and was struck cold to see her husband looking down at her, and, as it seemed to her, beckoning to her from a second-floor window. 
The window was open, and she distinctly saw his face, which she describes as being terribly agitated. He waved his hands frantically to her, and then vanished from the window so suddenly that it seemed to her that he had been plucked back by some irresistible force from behind. One singular point which struck her quick feminine eye was that although he wore some dark coat such as he had started town in, he had on neither collar nor necktie. Convinced that something was amiss with him, she rushed down the steps, for the house was none other than the opium den in which you found me tonight, and running through the front door, she attempted to ascend the stairs which led to the first floor. At the foot of the stairs, however, she met this Lasker scoundrel of whom I have spoken, who thrust her back and, aided by a Dane who acts as assistant there, pushed her out into the street. Filled with the most maddening doubts and fears, she rushed down the lane and, by rare good fortune, met in Fresno Street a number of constables with an inspector, all on their way to their beat. The inspector and two men accompanied her back, and in spite of the continued resistance of the proprietor, they made their way to the room in, wh in which Mr. St. Clair had last been seen. There was no sign of him there. In fact, in the whole of that floor, there was no one to be found save a crippled wretch of hideous aspect, who it seems made his home there. Both he and the Lasker stoutly swore that no one else had been in the front room during the afternoon. So determined was their denial that the inspector was staggered, and had almost come to believe that Mrs. St. Clair had been deluded when, with a cry, she sprang at a small deal box which lay upon the table and tore the lid from it. Out there fell a cascade of children's bricks. It was the toy which he had promised to bring home. This discovery, and the evident confusion which the cripple showed, made the inspector realize that the matter was serious. The rooms were carefully examined, and all results pointed to an abominable crime. The front room was plainly furnished as a sitting room and led into a small bedroom, which looked out upon the back of one of the wharves. Between the wharf and the bedroom window is a narrow strip, which is dry at low tide, but is covered at high tide with at least four and a half feet of water. The bedroom window was a broad one, and opened from below. On examination, traces of blood were to be seen upon the window sill, and several scattered drops were visible upon the wooden floor of the bedroom. Rust away behind a curtain in the front room were all the clothes of Mr. Neville St. Clair, with the exception of his coat. His boots, his socks, his hat, and his watch, all were there. There were no signs of violence upon any of these garments, and there were no other traces of Mr. Neville St. Clair. Out the window he must apparently have gone, for no other exit could be discovered, and the ominous bloodstains upon the sill gave little promise that he could save himself by swimming, for the tide was at its very highest at the moment of the tragedy. And now as to the villains who seemed to be immediately implicated in the matter. Alaska was known to be a man of the vilest antecedents, but as, by Mrs. St. Clair's story, he was known to have been at the foot of the stair within a very few seconds of her husband's appearance at the window, he could hardly have been more than an accessory to the crime. His defense was one of absolute ignorance, and he protested that he had no knowledge as to the doings of Hugh Boone, his lodger, and that he could not account in any way for the presence of the missing gentleman's clothes. So much for the Lasker manager. Now, for the sinister cripple who lives upon the second floor of the opium den, and who is certainly the last human being whose eyes rested upon Neville St. Clair, his name is Hugh Boone, and his hideous face is one which is familiar to every man who goes much to the city. He is a professional beggar, though in order to avoid the police regulations, he pretends to a small trade in wax vestas. Some little distance down Threadneedle Street, upon the left-hand side, there is, as you may have remarked, a small angle in the wall. Here it is that this creature takes his daily seat, cross-legged with his tiny stock of matches on his lap, and, as he is a piteous spectacle, a small rain of charity descends into the greasy leather cap which lies upon the pavement beside him. I have watched the fellow more than once before, ever I thought of making his professional acquaintance, and I have been surprised at the harvest which he has reaped in a short time. His appearance, you see, is so remarkable that no one can pass him without observing him. A shock of orange hair, a pale face disfigured by a horrible scar, which, by its contraction, has turned up the very outer edge of his upper lip. A bulldog chin, and a pair of very, very penetrating dark eyes, which present a singular contrast to the color of his hair, all mark him out from amid the common crowd of mendicants, and so too does his wit, for he is ever ready with a reply to any piece of chaff which may be thrown at him by the passers-by. This is the man whom we now learn to have been the lodger at the opium den, and to have been the last man to see the gentleman of whom we are in quest. But a cripple, said I. 
What could he have done with single-handed against a man in the prime of his life? He is a cripple in the sense that he walks with a limp, but in other respects he appears to be a powerful and well-nurtured man. Surely your medical experience would tell you, Watson, that weakness in one limb is often compensated for by exceptional strength in the others. Pray, continue your narrative. Mrs. St. Clair had fainted at the sight of the blood upon the window, and she was escorted home in a cab by the police, as her presence could be of no help to them in their investigations. Inspector Barton, who had charge of the case, made a very careful examination of the premises, but without finding anything which threw any light upon the matter. One mistake had been made in not arresting Boone instantly, as he was allowed some few minutes during which he might have communicated with his friend, the Lasker. But this fault was soon remedied, and he was seized and searched, without anything being found which could incriminate him. There were, it is true, some bloodstains upon his right shirt sleeve, but he pointed to his ring finger, which had been cut near the nail, and explained that the bleeding came from there adding that he had been to the window not long before, and that the stains which he had observed there doubtless came from the same source. He denied strenuously having ever seen Mr. Neville St. Clair, and swore that the presence of the clothes in his room was as much a mystery to him as to the police. As to Mrs. St. Clair's assertion that she had actually seen her husband at the window, he declared that she must have either been mad or dreaming. He was removed, loudly protesting, to the police station, while the inspector remained upon the premises in the hope that the ebbing tide might afford some fresh clue. And it did, though they hardly found upon the mudbank what they had feared to find. It was Neville St. Clair's coat, and not Neville St. Clair, which lay uncovered as the tide receded. And what do you think they found in the pockets? I cannot imagine. No, I don't think you would guess. Every pocket stuffed with pennies and half pennies. 421 pennies and 270 half pennies. It was no wonder that it had not been swept away by the tide. But a human body is a different matter. There's a fierce eddy between the wharf and the house. It seemed likely enough that the weighted coat had remained when the stripped body had been sucked away into the river. But I understand that all the other clothes were found in the room. Would the body be dressed in a coat alone? No, sir, but the facts might be met speciously enough. Suppose that this man Boone had thrust Neville St. Clair through the window. There's no human eye which could have seen the deed. What would he do then? It would of course instantly strike him that he must get rid of the telltale garments. He would seize the coat then, and be in the act of throwing it out, when it would occur to him that it would swim and not sink. He has little time, for he has heard the scuffle downstairs when the wife tried to force her way up, and perhaps he's already heard from his Lasker confederate that the police are hurrying up the street. There's not an instant to be lost. He rushes to some secret hoard where is accumulated the fruits of his beggary, and he stuffs all the coins upon which he can lay his hands into the pockets to make sure of the coat's sinking. He throws it out, and would have done the same with the other garments had he not heard the rush of steps below, and only just had time to close the window when the police appeared. It certainly sounds feasible. Well, we will take it as a working hypothesis for want of a better. Boone, as I have told you, was arrested and taken to the station, but it could not be shown that there had ever before been anything against him. He had for years been known as a professional beggar, but his life appeared to have been a very quiet and innocent one. There the matter stands at present, and the questions which have to be solved. What Neville St. Clair was doing in the opium den, what happened to him when there, where he is now, and what Hugh Boone had to do with his disappearance, are all as far from a solution as ever. I confess that I cannot recall any case within my, ex within my experience which looked at the first glance so simple, and yet which presented such difficulties. While Sherlock Holmes had been detailing this singular series of events, we had been whirling through the outskirts of the great town until the last straggling houses had been left behind, and we rattled along a country hedge upon either side of us. Just as he finished, however, we drove through two scattered villages where a few lights still glimmered in the windows. Ah, we are on the outskirts of Lee, said my companion. We have touched on three English counties in our short drive, starting in Middlesex, passing over an angle of Surrey, and ending in Kent. See that light among the trees? That is the Cedars, and beside that lamp sits a woman whose anxious ears have already, I have little doubt, caught the clink of our horse's feet. But why are you not conducting the case from Baker Street? I asked. Because there are many inquiries which must be made out here. Mrs. St. Clair has most kindly put two rooms at my disposal, and you may rest assured that she will have nothing but a welcome for my friend and colleague. 
I hate to meet her, Watson, when I have no news of her husband. But here we are. Whoa there, whoa. We had pulled up in front of a large villa which stood within its own grounds. The stable boy had run out to the horse's head, and springing down, I followed Holmes up the small, winding gravel drive which led to the house. As we approached, the door flew open, and a little blonde woman stood in the opening, clad in some sort of mousseline de soie, with a touch of fluffy pink chiffon at her neck and wrists. She stood with her figure outlined against the flood of light, one hand upon the door, one half raised in her eagerness, her body slightly bent, her head and face protruded, with eager eyes and parted lips, a standing question. Well, she cried, well? And then, seeing that there were two of us, she gave a cry of hope which sank into a groan as she saw that my companion shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. No good news? None. No bad? No. Thank God for that. But come in. You must be weary, for you have had a long day. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. He has been of most vital use to me in several of my cases, and a lucky chance has made it possible for me to bring him out and associate with him in this investigation. I am delighted to see you, said she, pressing my hand warmly. You will, I am sure, forgive anything that may be wanting in our arrangements when you consider the blow which has come so suddenly upon us. My dear madam, said I, I am an old campaigner. And if I were not well, I can very well see that no apology is needed. If I can be of any assistance, either to you or to my friend here, I shall be indeed happy. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said the lady as we entered a well-lit dining room, upon the table of which a cold supper had been laid out, I should very much like to ask you one or two plain questions, to which I beg that you will give a plain answer. Certainly, madam. Do not trouble about my feelings. I am not hysterical nor given to fainting. I simply wish to hear your real, real opinion. Upon what point? In your heart of hearts, do you think that Neville is alive? Sherlock Holmes seemed to be embarrassed by the question. Frankly now, she repeated, standing upon the rug and looking keenly down at him as he leaned back in a basket chair. Frankly then, madam, I do not. You think that he is dead? I do. Murdered? I don't say that, perhaps. And on what day did he meet his death? On Monday. Then perhaps, Mr. Holmes, you will be good enough to explain how it is that I have received a letter from him today. Sherlock Holmes sprang out of his chair as if he had been galvanized. What? He roared. Yes, today. She stood smiling, holding up a little slip of paper in the air. May I see it? Certainly. He snatched it from her in his eagerness and smoothing it out upon the table, he drew over the lamp and examined it intently. I had left my chair and was gazing at it over his shoulder. The envelope was a very coarse one, and was stamped with the Gravesend postmark, and with the date of that very day, or rather of the day before, for it was considerably after midnight. Coarse writing, murmured Holmes. Surely this is not your husband's writing, madam. No, but the enclosure is. I perceive also that whoever addressed the envelope had to go and inquire as to the address. How can you tell that? The name, you see, is in perfectly black ink which has dried itself. The rest is of the grayish color which shows that blotting paper has been used. If it had been written straight off and then blotted, none would be of a deep black shade. This man has written the name, and there has been a pause before he wrote the address, which can only mean that he was not familiar with it. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Let us now see the letter. Ha! Ah, there's been an enclosure here. Yes, there was a ring. His signet ring. Are you sure that this is your husband's hand? One of his hands. One? His hand when he wrote hurriedly. It's very unlike his usual writing, and yet I know it well. Dearest, do not be frightened. All will come well. There is a huge error which may take some little time to rectify. Wait in patience. Neville. Written in pencil upon the fly leaf of a book, octavo size, no watermark. Hmm. Posted today in Gravesend by a man with a dirty thumb. Ha! Ah, and the flap's been gummed, if I am very if I am not very much in error, by a person who had been chewing tobacco. And you have no doubt that it is your husband's hand, madam. None. Neville wrote those words. They were posted today at Gravesend. Well, Mrs. St. Clair, the clouds lighten, though I should not venture to say that the danger is over. But he must be alive, Mr. Holmes. Unless this is a clever forgery to put us on the wrong scent. The ring, after all, proves nothing. It may have been taken from him. 
No, no, it is. It is his very own writing. Very well. It may, however, have been written on Monday and only posted today. That is possible. If so, much may have happened between. Oh, you must not discourage me, Mr. Holmes. I know that all is well with him. There is so keen a sympathy between us that I should know if evil came upon him. On the very day that I saw him last, he cut himself in the bedroom, and yet I in the dining room rushed upstairs instantly with the utmost certainty that something had happened. Do you think that I would respond to such a trifle and yet be ignorant of his death? I have seen too much not to know that the impression of a woman may be more valuable than the conclusion of an analytical reasoner. And in this letter you have certainly a very strong piece of evidence to corroborate your view. But if your husband is alive and able to write letters, why should he remain away from you? I cannot imagine. It is unthinkable. And on Monday he made no remarks before leaving you. No. And you were surprised to see him in Swandham Lane. Very much so. Was the window open? Yes. Then he might have called to you. He might. He only, as I understand, gave an inarticulate cry. Yes. A call for help, you thought? Yes, he waved his hands. But it might have been a cry of surprise. Astonishment at the unexpected sight of you might cause him to throw up his hands. It is possible. And you thought he was pulled back. He disappeared so suddenly. He might have leaped back. You did not see anyone else in the room? No, but this horrible man confessed to having been there, and the Lasker was at the foot of the stairs. Quite so. Your husband, as far as you could see, had ordinary clothes on. But without his collar or tie, I distinctly saw his bare throat. Had he ever spoken of Swandham Lane? Never. Had he ever showed any signs of having taken opium? Never. Thank you, Mrs. St. Clair. Those are the principal points about which I wish to be absolutely clear. We shall now have a little supper and then retire, for we may have a very busy day tomorrow. A large and comfortable double-bedded room had been placed at our disposal, and I was quickly between the sheets, for I was weary after my night of adventure. Sherlock Holmes was a man, however, who, when he had an unsolved problem upon his mind, would go for days and even for a week without rest, turning it over, rearranging his facts, looking at it from every point of view until he had either fathomed it or convinced himself that his data were insufficient. It was soon evident to me that he was now preparing for an all-night sitting. He took off his coat and waistcoat, put on a large blue dressing gown, and had wandered about the room collecting pillows from his bed and cushions from the sofa and armchairs. With these, he constructed a sort of eastern divan, upon which he perched himself cross-legged, with an ounce of shag tobacco and a box of matches laid out in front of him. In the dim light of the lamp I saw him sitting there, an old briar pipe between his lips, his eyes fixed vacantly upon the corner of the ceiling, the blue smoke curling up from him, silent, motionless, with the light shining upon his strong-set aquiline features. So he sat as I dropped off to sleep, and so he sat when a sudden ejaculation caused me to wake up, and I found the summer sun shining into the apartment. The pipe was still between his lips, the smoke still curled upward, and the room was full of a dense tobacco haze, but nothing remained of the heap of shag which I had seen upon the previous night. Awake, Watson? he asked. Yes. Game for a morning drive? Certainly. Then dress. No one is stirring yet, but I know where the stable boy sleeps, and we shall soon have the trap out. He chuckled to himself as he spoke. His eyes twinkled, and he seemed a different man to the somber thinker of the previous night. As I dressed, I glanced at my watch. It was no wonder that no one was stirring. It was twenty-five minutes past four. I had hardly finished when Holmes returned with the news that the boy was putting in the horse. I want to test a little theory of mine, said he, pulling on his boots. I think, Watson, that you are now standing in the presence of one of the most absolute fools in Europe. I deserve to be kicked from here to Charing Cross. But I think I have the key of the affair now. And where is it? I asked, smiling. In the bathroom, he answered. Oh yes, I am not joking, he continued, seeing my look of incredulity. I've just been there, and I've taken it out, and I've got it in this Gladstone bag. Come on, my boy, and we shall see whether it will fit the lock. Just a moment, class, I need a sip of my drink. We made our way downstairs as quietly as possible, and out into the bright morning sunshine. In the road stood our horse and trap, with the half-clad stable boy waiting at the head. We both sprang in, and away we dashed down the London road. 
A few country carts were stirring, bearing in vegetables to the metropolis, but the lines of villas on either side were as silent and lifeless as some city in a dream. It has been in some points a singular case, said Holmes, flicking the horse on into a gallop. I confess that I have been as blind as a mole, but it is better to learn wisdom late than never to learn it at all. In town, the earliest risers were just beginning to look sleepily from their windows as we drove through the streets of the Surrey side. Passing down the Waterloo Bridge Road, we crossed over the river, and dashing up Wellington Street, wheeled sharply to the right and found ourselves in Bow Street. Sherlock Holmes was well known to the force, and the two constables at the door saluted him. One of them held the horse's head while the other led us in. Who is on duty? asked Holmes. Inspector Bradstreet, sir. Ah, Bradstreet, how are you? A tall, stout official had come down the stone-flagged passage, in a peaked cap and frogged jacket. I wish to have a quiet word with you, Bradstreet. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Step into my room here. It was a small, office-like room, with a huge ledger upon the table, and a telephone projecting from the wall. The inspector sat down at his desk. What can I do for you, Mr. Holmes? I called about that beggar man, Boone, the one who was charged with being concerned in the disappearance of Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee. Yes, he was brought up and remanded for further inquiries. So I heard. You have him here? In the cells. Is he quiet? Oh, he gives no trouble. But he is a dirty scoundrel. Dirty? Yes, it is all we can do to make him wash his hands, and his face is as black as a tinker's. Well, when once his case has been settled, he will have a regular prison bath, and I think if you saw him, you would agree with me that he needed it. I should like to see him very much. Would you? That is easily done. Come this way. You can leave your bag. No, I think that I'll take it. Very good. Come this way, if you please. He led us down a passage, opened a barred door, passed down a winding stair, and brought us to a whitewashed corridor with a line of doors on each side. The third on the right is his, said the inspector. Here it is. Quickly shot back a panel in the upper part of the door and glanced through. He is asleep, said he. You can see him very well. We put both our eyes to the grating. The prisoner lay with his face towards us in a very deep sleep, breathing slowly and heavily. He was a middle-sized man, coarsely clad as became his calling, with a colored shirt protruding through the rent in his tattered coat. He was, as the inspector had said, extremely dirty, but the grime which covered his face could not conceal its repulsive ugliness. A broad wheel from an old scar ran right across it from eye to chin, and by its contraction had turned up one side of the upper lip so that three teeth were exposed in a perpetual snarl. A shock of very bright red hair grew low over his eyes and forehead. His beauty, isn't he? said the inspector. He certainly needs a wash, remarked Holmes. I had an idea that he might, and I took the liberty of bringing the tools with me. He opened the Gladstone bag as he spoke, and took out, to my astonishment, a very large bath sponge. <laughs> you are a funny one, chuckled the inspector. Now, if you'll have the great goodness to open that door very quietly, we will soon make him cut a much more respectable figure. Well, I don't know why not, said the inspector. He doesn't look a credit to the Bow Street cells, does he? He slipped his key into the lock. We all very quietly entered the cell. The sleeper half turned, and then settled down once more into a deep slumber. Holmes stooped to the water jug, moistened his sponge, and then rubbed it twice vigorously across and down the prisoner's face. Let me introduce you, he shouted, to Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee in the county of Kent. Never in my life have I seen such a sight. The man's face peeled off under the sponge like the bark from a tree. Gone was the coarse brown tint. Gone, too, was the horrid scar which had seamed it across, and the twisted lip which had given the repulsive sneer to the face. A twitch brought away the tangled red hair, and there, sitting up in his bed, was a pale, sad-faced, refined-looking man, black-haired and smooth-skinned, rubbing his eyes and staring about him with sleepy bewilderment. Then suddenly realizing the exposure, he broke into a scream and threw himself down his face into the pillows. "'Great heavens!' cried the inspector. "'It is indeed the missing man. I know him from the photograph!' The prisoner turned with the reckless air of a man who abandons himself to his destiny. "'Be it so!' said he, and pray, what am I charged with? With making away with Mr. Neville St. Oh, come, you can't be charged with that unless they make a case of attempted suicide of it, said the inspector with a grin. Well, I have been 27 years in the force, but this really takes the cake. 
If I am Mr. Neville St. Clair, then it is obvious that no crime has been committed and that therefore I am illegally detained. No crime, but a very great error has been committed, said Holmes. You would have done better to have trusted your wife. It was not the wife, it was the children, groaned the prisoner. God help me, I would not have them ashamed of their father. My God, what an exposure, what can I do? Sherlock Holmes sat down beside him on the couch and patted him kindly on the shoulder. If you leave it to a court of law to clear the matter up, said he, of course you can hardly avoid publicity. On the other hand, if you convince the police authorities that there is no possible case against you, I do not know that there is any reason that the details should not find their way into the papers. Oh, sorry, I do not know that there is any reason that the details should find their way into the papers. Inspector Bradstreet would, I am sure, make notes upon anything which you might tell us and submit it to the proper authorities. The case would then never go into court at all. God bless you, cried the prisoner passionately. I would have endured imprisonment, ay, even execution, rather than have left my miserable secret as a family blot to my children. You are the first who have ever heard my story. My father was a schoolmaster in Chesterfield, where I received an excellent education. I traveled in my youth, took to the stage, and finally became a reporter on an evening paper in London. One day, my editor wished to have a series of articles upon begging in the metropolis, and I volunteered to supply them. There was the point from which all my adventures started. It was only by trying begging as an amateur that I could get the facts upon which to base my articles. When an actor I had, of course, learned all the secrets of making up and had been famous in the green room for my skill, I took advantage now of my attainments. I painted my face, and to make myself as pitiable as possible, I made a good scar and fixed one side of my lip in a twist by the aid of a small slip of flesh-colored plaster. Then, with a red head of hair and an appropriate dress, I took my station in the business part of the city, ostensibly as a match seller, but really as a beggar. For seven hours I plied my trade, and when I returned home in the evening, I found to my surprise that I had received no less than twenty-six shillings, or... I don't know pre-decimalization uh, English currency. I apologize, class. That's embarrassing. What was lower than shilling? Whoops. I should have looked that up ahead of time. <laughs> but anyway, on with the story. If someone wants to look that up and correct your teacher, please do so. But anyway, now back to Mr. Neville St. Clair's confession. I wrote my articles and thought little more of the matter until some time later I backed a bill for a friend and had a writ served upon me for twenty-five pounds. I was at my wit's end where to get the money, but a sudden idea came to me. I begged a fortnight's grace from the creditor, asked a holiday from my employers, and spent the time begging in the city under my disguise. In ten days I had the money and had paid the debt. Well, you can imagine how hard it was to settle down to arduous work at two pounds a week when I knew that I could earn as much in a day by smearing my face with a little paint, laying my cap on the ground, and sitting still. It was a long fight between my pride and the money, but the dollars won at last, and I threw up reporting and sat day after day in the corner which I had first chosen, inspiring pity by my ghastly face and filling my pockets with coppers. Only one man knew my secret. He was the keeper of a low den in which I used to lodge in Swandham Lane, where I could every morning emerge myself as a squalid beggar, and in the evenings transform myself into a well-dressed man about town. This fellow, a Lasker, was well paid for me, <clears throat> well paid by me for his rooms, so that I knew my secret was safe in his possession. Well, very soon I found that I was saving considerable sums of money. I do not mean that any beggar in the streets of London could earn seven hundred pounds a year, which is less than my average takings, but I had exceptional advantages in my power of making up, and also in a facility of repartee, which improved by practice and made me quite a recognized character in the city. All day a stream of pennies, varied by silver, poured in upon me, and it was a very bad day in which I failed to take two pounds. As I grew richer, I grew more ambitious, took a house in the country, and eventually married without anyone having a suspicion as to my real occupation. My dear wife knew that I had business in the city. She little knew what. Last Monday, I had finished for the day and was dressing in my room above the opium den when I looked out of my window and saw, to my horror and astonishment, that my wife was standing in the street with her eyes fixed full upon me. I gave a cry of surprise, threw up my arms to cover my face, and rushing to my confidant, the Lasker, entreated him to prevent anyone from coming up to see me. I heard her voice downstairs, but I knew that she could not ascend. 
Swiftly I threw off my clothes, pulled on those of a beggar, and put out my pigments and wig. Even a wife's eyes could not pierce so complete a disguise. But then it occurred to me that there might be a search in the room, and that the clothes might betray me. I threw open the window, reopening by my violence a small cut which I had inflicted upon myself in the bedroom that morning. Then I seized my coat, which was weighted by the coppers which I had just transferred to it from the leather bag in which I carried my takings. I hurled it out of the window, and it disappeared into the Thames. The other clothes would have followed, but at that moment there was a rush of constables up the stair, and a few minutes after I found, rather, I confess to my relief, that instead of being identified as Mr. Neville St. Clair, I was arrested as his murderer. I do not know that there is anything else for me to explain. I was determined to preserve my disguise as long as possible, and hence my preference for a dirty face. Knowing that my wife would be terribly anxious, I slipped off my ring and confided it to the Lasker at a moment when no constable was watching me, together with a hurried scrawl, telling her that she had no cause to fear. That note only reached her yesterday, said Holmes. Good God! What a week she must have spent! The police have watched this, Lasker, said Inspector Bradstreet. I can quite understand that he might find it difficult to post a letter unobserved. Probably he handed it to some sailor customer of his, who forgot all about it for some days. That was it, said Holmes, nodding approvingly. I have no doubt of it. But you've never been prosecuted for begging. Many times. But what was a fine to me? It must stop here, however, said Bradstreet. If the police are to hush this thing up, there must be no more of Hugh Boone. I have sworn it by the most solemn oaths which a man can take. I think in that case that it is probable that no further steps may be taken. But if you are found again, then all must come out. I am sure, Mr. Holmes, that we are very much indebted to you for having cleared the matter up. I wish I knew how you reach your results. I reached this one, said my friend, by sitting upon five pillows and consuming an ounce of shag. I think, Watson, that if we drive to Baker Street, we shall just be in time for breakfast. Let's see, 12 pence a shilling, 20 shillings a pound. Okay, yeah, and using the weight of the coins to figure out value. Yeah, that does make sense. All right. So, I feel, class, that the conclusion of that story of the disappearance of Mr. Neville St. Clair was rather an obvious one from the start. Do you feel the same way? Man seen in the window. No one there but a dirty beggar. Hmm. Where could he have gone? It seems a wonder that Holmes should miss something so simple as that. It is a fun story, and I especially like the way it begins, with Watson solving a disappearance on his own. You know, entreated by a wife's friend to find an, a, you know, an acquaintance of his, who's so absolutely zonked out of his mind on opium that he thinks it's Wednesday when it's Friday sends that man home, turns around and sees no one else but Sherlock Holmes there in that opium den. If any of you watched the BBC series Sherlock, there was an episode that began in a similar way with uh, Watson coming upon Holmes in a opium den or might have been adapted into a crack den or something like that. Very fun, very classic sort of beginning. So to anyone who joined us mid-story, first, thank you for coming. I am Professor Bloom. I enjoy reading stories, as I'm doing now. I also do music recording stream. Yeah, that show, Sherlock, while it was very enjoyable, kind of glossed over some things that would otherwise seem fairly important or otherwise anachronistic. I don't even think the excuse of being ex-military would fly for Watson there. I mean, maybe he just illegally has a pistol. Who knows? Yeah. I don't think... Um, I'm willing to grant it the license of fiction and fitting in with the character. I mean, certainly at the time these stories were set, late 1890s, I don't think anyone would have glanced twice at a you know, veteran doctor John Watson carrying a pistol on him as he was a gentleman. Very interesting. The Isle of Man, as I understand it, is a crown protectorate, but not technically part of the UK. 
I would very much like to visit there someday. And had actually planned on doing so in 2020 until I could not for clearly obvious reasons. There's actually quite an interesting old electric railway on the Isle of Man, as well as one of the largest water wheels used to pump out a mine in all of Europe, built in the late 1700s, I believe. But I digress. As I was saying, for anyone who joined midway through the story, I'm Professor Bloom. I enjoy reading stories, usually once a week. I do music recording streams of either classical music, or particularly barbershop quartets. And I also do video gaming streams. So, I'm quite enjoying myself. I hope that the night is starting to cool off for some of you. I know it's been a heat wave across many places, certainly where I am. I've got a fan pointed at me and a cold drink in hand, so it's not so bad. Though I do quite wish I had air conditioning. But I think now we shall continue on with the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. Give me just a moment, class, for a another sip of my drink. I hope you are all relaxed and enjoying. The background music's not too loud, is it? I believe I've kept it to a manageable level, but do let me know if I've not. All right. So now we return to the adventures of Dr. John Watson and Mr. Sherlock Holmes with the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. I had called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes upon the second morning after Christmas with the intention of wishing him the compliments of the season. He was lounging upon the sofa in a purple dressing gown, a pipe rack within his reach upon the right, and a pile of crumpled morning papers, evidently newly studied, near at hand. Beside the couch was a wooden chair, and on the angle of the back hung a very seedy and disreputable hard felt hat, much the worse for wear, and cracked in several places. A lens and a forceps lying upon the seat of the chair suggested that the hat had been suspended in this manner for the purpose of examination. You are engaged, said I. Perhaps I interrupt you. Not at all. I am glad to have a friend with whom I can discuss my results. The matter is a perfectly trivial one, he jerked his thumb in the direction of the old hat, but there are points in connection with it which are not entirely devoid of interest and even of instruction. I seated myself in his armchair and warmed my hands before his crackling fire, for a sharp frost had set in, and the windows were thick with the ice crystals. I suppose, I remarked, that, homely as it looks, this thing has some deadly story linked on to it that it is the clue which will guide you in the solution of some mystery and the punishment of some crime. No, no, no crime, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. Only one of those whimsical little incidents which will happen when you have four million human beings all jostling each other within the space of a few square miles. Amid the action and reaction of so dense a swarm of humanity, every possible combination of events may be expected to take place, and many a little problem will be presented which may be striking and bizarre without being criminal. We have already had experience of such. So much so, I remarked, that of the last six cases which I have added to my notes, three have been entirely free of any legal crime. Precisely. You allude to my attempt to recover the Irene Adler papers, to the singular case of Miss Mary Sutherland, and to the adventure of the man with the twisted lip. Well, I have no doubt that this small matter will fall into that same innocent category. You know Peterson, the commissionaire? Yes. It is to him that this trophy belongs. It is his hat. No, no, he found it. Its owner is unknown. I beg that you will look upon it not as a battered billycock, but as an intellectual problem. And first, as to how it came here. It arrived upon Christmas morning, in company with a good fat goose, which is, I have no doubt, roasting at this moment in front of Peterson's fire. The facts are these. About four o'clock on Christmas morning, Peterson who, as you know, is a very honest fellow, was returning from some small jollification and was making his way homeward down Tottenham Court Road. In front of him he saw, in the gaslight, 
a tallish man, walking with a slight stagger and carrying a white goose slung over his shoulder. As he reached the corner of Gooch Street, a row broke out between this stranger and a little knot of roughs. One of the latter knocked off the man's hat, on which he raised his stick to defend himself and, swinging it over his head, smashed the shop window behind him. Peterson had rushed forward to protect the stranger from his assailants, but the man, shocked at having broken the window and seeing an official-looking person in uniform rushing towards him, dropped his goose, took to his heels, and vanished amid the labyrinth of small streets which lie at the back of Tottenham Court Road. The roughs had also fled at the appearance of Peterson, so that he was left in possession of the field of battle, and also of the spoils of victory in the shape of this battered hat and a most unimpeachable Christmas goose, which surely he restored to their owner. My dear fellow, there lies the problem. It is true that, for Mrs. Henry Baker, was printed upon a small card which was tied to the bird's left leg, and it is also true that the initials HB are legible upon the lining of this hat. But as there are some thousands of bakers, and some hundreds of Henry Bakers in the city of ours, it is not easy to restore lost property to any one of them. What then did Peterson do? He brought round both hat and goose to me on Christmas morning, knowing that even the smallest problems are of interest to me. The goose we retained until this morning, when there were signs that, in spite of the slight frost, it would be well that it should be eaten without unnecessary delay. Its finder has carried it off, therefore, to fulfill the ultimate destiny of a goose, while I continue to retain the hat of the unknown gentleman who lost his Christmas dinner. Did he not advertise? No. Then what clue could you have as to his identity? Only as much as we can deduce. From his hat. Precisely. But you are joking. What can you gather from this old, battered felt? Here is my lens. You know my methods. What can you gather yourself as to the individuality of the man who has worn this article? I took the tattered object in my hands and turned it over rather ruefully. It was a very ordinary black hat of the usual round shape, hard, and much the worse for wear. The lining had been of red silk, but was a good deal discolored. There was no maker's name, but as Holmes had remarked, the initials HB were scrawled upon one side, it was pierced in the brim for a hat securer, but the elastic was missing. For the rest, it was cracked, exceedingly dusty, and spotted in several places, although there seemed to have been some attempt to hide the discolored patches by smearing them with ink. I can see nothing, said I, handing it back to my friend. On the contrary, Watson, you can see everything. You fail, however, to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences. Then. Pray tell me what it is that you can infer from this hat. He picked it up and gazed at it in the peculiar introspective fashion which was characteristic of him. It is perhaps less suggestive than it might have been, he remarked, and yet there are a few inferences upon which are very distinct, and a few others which represent at least a strong balance of probability. That the man was highly intellectual is of course obvious upon the face of it and also that he was fairly well-to-do within the last three years, although he has now fallen upon evil days. He had foresight, but has less now than formerly, pointing to a moral retrogression, which, when taken with the decline of his fortune, seemed to indicate some evil influence, probably drink, at work upon him. This may account also for the obvious fact that his wife has ceased to love him. My dear Holmes, he has, however, retained some degree of self-respect, he continued, disregarding my remonstrance. He is a man who lives a sedentary life, goes out little, is out of training entirely, is middle-aged, has grizzled hair which he has had cut within the last few days, and which he anoints with lime cream. These are the more patent facts which are to be deduced from his hat. Also, by the way, that it is extremely improbable that he has gas laid on in his house. You are certainly joking, Holmes. Not in the least. It is possible that even now when I give you these results, you are unable to see how they are attained. I have no doubt that I am very stupid but I must confess that I am unable to follow you. For example, how did you deduce that this man was intellectual? For answer, Holmes clapped the hat upon his head, came right over his forehead, and settled upon the bridge of his nose. It is a question of cubic capacity, said he. A man with so large a brain must have something in it. The decline of his fortunes, then? This hat is three years old. These flat brims curled at the edge came in, then. It is a hat of the very best quality. Look at the band of ribbed silk and the excellent lining. If this man could afford to buy so expensive a hat three years ago, and has had no hat since then, then he has assuredly gone down in the world. 
Well, that is clear enough, certainly. But how about the foresight and the moral retrogression? Sherlock Holmes laughed. Here is the foresight, said he, putting his finger upon the little disc and loop of the hat securer. They are never sold upon hats. If this man ordered one, it is a sign of a certain amount of foresight, since he went out of his way to take this precaution against the wind. But, since we see that he has broken the elastic and has not troubled to replace it, it is obvious that he has less foresight now than formerly, which is a distinct proof of a weakening nature. On the other hand, he has endeavored to conceal some of these stains upon the felt by daubing them with ink, which is a sign that he has not entirely lost his self-respect. Your reasoning is certainly plausible. The further points that he is middle-aged, that his hair is grizzled, that it has been recently cut, and that he uses lime cream are all to be gathered from a close examination of the lower part of the lining. The lens discloses a large number of hair ends, clean cut by the scissors of the barber. They all appear to be adhesive, and there is a distinct odor of lime cream. This dust, you will observe, is not the gritty gray dust of the street, but the fluffy brown dust of the house, showing that it has been hung up indoors most of the time. All the marks of moisture upon the inside are proof positive that the wearer perspired very freely and could therefore hardly be in the best of training. But his wife, who said that she had ceased to love him. This hat has not been brushed for weeks. When I see you, my dear Watson, with a week's accumulation of dust upon your hat, and when your wife allows you to go out in such a state, I shall fear that you also have been unfortunate enough to lose your wife's affections. But he might be a bachelor. Nay, he was bringing home the goose as a peace offering to his wife. Remember the card upon the bird's leg? You have an answer to everything. But how on earth do you deduce that the gas is not laid on in his house? One tallow stain, or even two, might come by chance. But when I see no less than five, I think that there can be little doubt that the individual must be brought into frequent contact with burning tallow. Walks upstairs at night, probably, with his hat in one hand and a guttering candle in the other. Anyhow... He never got tallow stains from a gas jet. Are you satisfied? <laughs> well, it is very ingenious, said I, laughing. But since, as you said just now, there's been no crime committed and no harm done save the loss of a goose, all this seems to be rather a waste of energy. Sherlock Holmes had opened his mouth to reply when the door flew open and Peterson, the commissionaire, rushed into the apartment with flushed cheeks in the face of a man who was dazed with astonishment. The goose, Mr. Holmes! The goose, sir! He gasped. Eh, what of it, then? Is it returned to life and flapped off through the kitchen window? Holmes twisted himself round upon the sofa to get a fairer view of the man's excited face. See here, sir! See what my wife found in its crop! He held out his hand and displayed upon the center of the palm a brilliantly scintillating blue stone, rather smaller than a bean in size, but of such purity and radiance that it twinkled like an electric point in the dark hollow of his hand. Sherlock Holmes sat up with a whistle. "'By Jove, Peterson,' said he, "'this is a treasure trove indeed. "'I suppose you know what you've got. "'A diamond, sir? "'A precious stone? "'It cuts into glass as though it were putty. "'It's more than a precious stone. "'It is THE precious stone. "'Not the Countess of Morker's blue carbuncle,' I ejaculated. "'Precisely so. "'I ought to know its size and shape, "'seeing that I have read the advertisement about it "'in the Times every day lately.' It is absolutely unique, and its value can only be conjectured, but the reward offered of a thousand pounds is certainly not within a twentieth part of the market price. A thousand pounds! Great Lord of Mercy! The commissioner plumped down into a chair and stared from one to the other of us. That is the reward, and I have reason to know that there are sentimental considerations in the background which would induce the Countess to part with half her fortune if she could but recover the gem. It was lost, if I remember aright, at the Hotel Cosmopolitan, I remarked. Precisely so. On December 22nd, just five days ago, John Horner, a plumber, was accused of having abstracted it from the lady's jewel case. The evidence against him was so strong that the case has been referred to the Assizes. I have some account of the matter here, I believe. He rummaged amid his newspapers, glancing over the dates, until at last he smoothed one out, doubled it over, and read the following paragraph. Hotel Cosmopolitan Jewel Robbery. John Horner, 26, plumber, was brought up upon the charge of having upon the 22nd abstracted from the jewel case of the Countess of Morcar the valuable gem known as the Blue Carbuncle. James Ryder, upper attendant at the hotel, gave his evidence to the effect that he had shown Horner up to the dressing room of the Countess of Morcar upon the day of the robbery in order that he might solder the second bar of the grate, which was loose. 
He had remained with Horner some little time, but had finally been called away. On returning, he found that Horner had disappeared, that the bureau had been forced open, and that the small Morocco casket in which, as it afterwards transpired, the Countess was accustomed to keeping her jewel, was lying empty upon the dressing table. Ryder instantly gave the alarm, and Horner was arrested the same evening, but the stone could not be found either upon his person or in his rooms. Catherine Cusack, maid to the Countess, opposed to having heard Ryder's cry of dismay on discovering the robbery, and to having rushed into the room, where she found matters as described by the last witness. Inspector Bradstreet, B Division, gave evidence as to the arrest of Horner, who struggled frantically, protested his innocence in the strongest terms. Evidence of a previous conviction for robbery having been given against the prisoner, the magistrate refused to deal summarily with the offense, but referred it to the Assizes. Horner, who had shown signs of intense emotion during the proceedings, fainted away at the conclusion and was carried out of court. Hm. So much for the police court, said Holmes thoughtfully, tossing aside the paper. The question for us now to solve is the sequence of events leading from a rifled jewel case at one end to the crop of a goose in Tottenham Court Road at the other. You see, Watson, our little deductions have suddenly assumed a much more important and less innocent aspect. Here is the stone. The stone came from the goose, and the goose came from Mr. Henry Baker, the gentleman with the bad hat and all the other characteristics with which I have bored you. So now, we must set ourselves very seriously to finding this gentleman, and to ascertaining what part he has played in this little mystery. To do this, we must try the simplest means first, and these lie undoubtedly in an advertisement in all the evening papers. If this fail, I shall have recourse to other methods. What will you say? Give me a pencil and that slip of paper. Now then. Found at the corner of Goodge Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have the same by applying at 6.30 this evening at 221B Baker Street. That is clear and concise. Very. But will he see it? Well, he is sure to keep an eye on the papers, since, to a poor man, the loss was a heavy one. He was clearly so scared by his mischance in breaking the window and by the approach of Peterson that he thought of nothing but flight. But since then, he must have bitterly regretted the impulse which caused him to drop his bird. Then again, the introduction of his name will cause him to see it, for everyone who knows him will direct his attention to it. Here you are, Mr. Peterson. Run down to the advertising agency and have this put in the evening papers. In which, sir? Oh, in the Globe, Star, Pall Mall, St. James Gazette, Evening News, Standard, Echo, and any others that occur to you. Very well, sir. And the stone? Ah, yes. I shall keep the stone. Thank you. And, I say, Peterson, just buy a goose on your way back and leave it here with me, for we must have one to give to this gentleman in place of the one which your family is now devouring. When the commissioner had gone, Holmes took up the stone and held it against the light. It's a bonny thing, said he. Just see how it glints and sparkles. Of course, it is a nucleus and focus of crime. Every good stone is. They are the devil's pet baits. In the larger and older jewels, every facet may stand for a bloody deed. This stone is not yet twenty years old. It was found in the banks of the Amoy River in southern China, and is remarkable in having every characteristic of the carbuncle, save that it is blue in shade instead of ruby red. In spite of its youth, it has already a sinister history. There have been two murders, a vitriol throwing, a suicide, and several robberies brought about for the sake of this forty-grain weight of crystallized charcoal. Who would think that so pretty a toy would be a purveyor to the gallows in the prison? I'll lock it up in my strong box now and drop a line to the Countess to say that we have it. Do you think this man Horner is innocent? I cannot tell. Well then, do you imagine that this other one, Henry Baker, has anything to do with the matter? It is, I think, much more likely that Henry Baker is an absolutely innocent man, who had no idea that the bird which he was carrying was of considerably more value than if it were made of solid gold. That, however, I shall determine by a very simple test if we have an answer to our advertisement. And you can do nothing until then. Nothing. In that case, I shall continue my professional round, but I shall come back in the evening at the hour you have mentioned, for I should like to see the solution of so tangled a business. Very glad to see you. I dine at seven. There's a woodcock, I believe. By the way, in view of recent occurrences, perhaps I ought to ask Mrs. Hudson to examine its crop. I had been delayed at a case, and it was a little after half past six when I found myself in Baker Street once more. As I approached the house, I saw a tall man in a scotch bonnet with a coat which was buttoned up to his chin, waiting outside in the bright semicircle which was thrown from the fanlight. 
Just as I arrived, the door was opened, and we were shown up together to Holmes's room. Mr. Henry Baker, I believe, said he, rising from his armchair and greeting his visitor with the easy air of geniality which he could so readily assume. Pray, take this chair by the fire, Mr. Baker. It is a cold night, and I observe that your circulation is more adapted for summer than for winter. Ah, Watson, you've just come at the right time. Is that your hat, Mr. Baker? Yes, sir, that is undoubtedly my hat. He was a large man with rounded shoulders, a massive head, and a broad, intelligent face, sloping down to a pointed beard of grizzled brown. A touch of red in nose and cheeks, with a slight tremor of his extended hand, recalled Holmes's surmise as to his habits. His rusty black frock coat was buttoned right up in front, with the collar turned up, and his lank wrists protruded from his sleeves without a sign of cuff or shirt. He spoke in a slow, staccato fashion, choosing his words with care, and gave the impression generally of a man of learning and letters, who had had ill usage at the hands of fortune. "'We have retained these things for some days,' said Holmes." because we expected, to see an advert uh, we expected to see an advertisement from you giving your address. I am at a loss to know now why, did you, why you did not advertise. Our visitor gave a rather shamefaced laugh. Shillings have not been so plentiful with me as they once were, he remarked. I had no doubt that the gang of roughs who assaulted me had carried off both my hat and the bird. I did not care to spend more money in a hopeless attempt at recovering them. Very naturally. By the way, about the bird, we were compelled to eat it. To eat it? Our visitor half rose from his chair in excitement. Yes, it would have been of no use to anyone had we not done so. But I presume that this other goose upon the sideboard, which is about the same weight and perfectly fresh, will answer your purpose equally well. Oh, certainly, certainly, answered Mr. Baker with a sigh of relief. Of course, we still have the feathers, legs, crop, and so on your own bird, so if you wish... The man burst into a hearty laugh. They might be useful to me as relics of my adventure, said he. But beyond that, I can hardly see what use the distracta membra of my late acquaintance are going to be to me. No, sir, I think that, with your permission, I will confine my attentions to the excellent bird which I perceive upon the sideboard. Sherlock Holmes glanced, glanced sharply across at me, a slight shrug of his shoulders. There is your hat, then, and there your bird, said he. By the way, would it bore you to tell me where you got the other one from? I am somewhat of a foul fancier. I have seldom seen a better grown goose. Certainly, sir, said Baker, who had risen and tucked his newly gained property under his arm. There are a few of us who frequent the Alpha Inn near the museum. We are to be found in the museum itself during the day, you understand. This year our good host, uh, Windigate by name, instituted a goose club, by which, on consideration of some few pence every week, we were each to receive a bird at Christmas. My pence were duly paid, and the rest is familiar to you. I am much indebted to you, sir, for a Scotch bonnet is fitted neither to my years nor my gravity. With a comical pomposity of manner, he bowed solemnly to both of us, and strode off upon his way. So much for Mr. Henry Baker, said Holmes when he had closed the door behind him. It is quite certain that he knows nothing whatever about the matter. Are you hungry, Watson? Not particularly. Then I suggest that we turn our dinner into a supper and follow up this clue while it is still hot. By all means. It was a bitter night, so we drew on our ulsters and wrapped cravats about our throats. Outside, the stars were shining coldly in a cloudless sky, and the breath of the passers-by blew out into smoke like so many pistol shots. Our footfalls rang out crisply and loudly as we swung through the doctor's quarter. Wimpole Street, Harley Street and so through Wigmore Street into Oxford Street. In a quarter of an hour, we were in Bloomsbury, at the Alpha Inn, which is a small public house at the corner of one of the streets which runs down into Holborn. Holmes pushed upon the door of the private bar and ordered two glasses of beer from the ruddy-faced, white-aproned landlord. "'Your beer should be excellent if it is as good as your geese,' said he. "'My geese?' The man seemed surprised. Yes, I was speaking only half an hour ago to Mr. Henry Baker, who is a member of your goose club. Ah, uh, yes, I see. But you see, sir, them's not our geese. Indeed. Whose, then? Well, I got the two dozen from a salesman in Covent Garden. Indeed. I know some of them. Which was it? Breckenridge is his name. Ah, I don't know him. Well, here's to your good health, landlord, and prosperity to your house. Good night. 
Now for Mr. Breckenridge, he continued, buttoning up his coat as we came out into the frosty air. Remember, Watson, that though we have so homely a thing as a goose at one end of this chain, we have at the other a man who will certainly get seven years' penal servitude unless we can establish his innocence. It is possible that our inquiry may but confirm his guilt, but, in any case, we have a line of investigation which has been missed by the police, and which a singular chance has placed in our hands. Let us follow it out to the bitter end. Faces to the south, then, and quick march. We passed across Holborn, down Endell Street, and so through a zigzag of slums to Covent Garden Market. One of the largest stalls bore the name of Breckenridge upon it, and the proprietor, a horsey-looking man with a sharp face and trim side whiskers, was helping a boy to put up the shutters. Good evening. It's a cold night, said Holmes. The salesman nodded, not a questioning glance at my companion. <sighs> Sold out of geese, I see continued Holmes, pointing at the bare slabs of marble. Let you have five hundred tomorrow morning. Ah, that's no good. Well, there are some on the stall with the gas flare. Ah, but I was recommended to you. Who by? The landlord of the Alpha. Oh, yes, I sent him a couple dozen. Fine birds they were, too. Now, where did you get them from? To my surprise, the question provoked a burst of anger from the salesman. Now then, mister, said he, with his head cocked and arms akimbo, what are you driving at? Let's have it straight now. It is straight enough. I should like to know who sold you the geese which you supplied to the Alpha. Well, then I shan't tell you, so now. Oh, it's a matter of no importance, but I don't know why you should be so warm over such a trifle. Warm? You'd be as warm, maybe, if you were as pestered as I am. Well, I pay good money for a good article, there should be an end to the business. But it's, where are the geese? And who'd you sell all the geese to? And what will you take for the geese? One would think there were the only geese in the world to hear the fuss that's made over them. Well, I have no connection with any other people who have been making inquiries, said Holmes carelessly. If you won't tell us, the bet is off, that's all. But I'm always ready to back my opinion on a matter of fowls, and I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate is country bred. Well, then you lost your fiver for its town bread, snapped the salesman. It's nothing of the kind. I say it is. I don't believe it. You think you know more about fowls than I have handed them ever since I was a nipper? I tell you, all those birds that went to the Alpha were town bred. You'll never persuade me to believe that. Will you bet, then? It's merely taking your money, for I know that I am right. But I'll have a sovereign on with you just to teach you not to be obstinate. The salesman chuckled grimly. Bring me the books, Bill, said he. The small boy brought round a small thin volume and a great greasy-backed one, laying them out together beneath the hanging lamp. Now then, Mr. Cocksure, said the salesman, I thought that I was out to geese, but before I finish you'll find that there's still one left in my shop. You see this little book? Well, that's the list of the folk from whom I buy. Do you see? Well, then, here on this page are the country folk, and the numbers after their names are where their accounts are in the big ledger. Now then, you see this other page in red ink. Well, that is a list of my town suppliers. Now look at that third name. Just read it out to me. Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, 249, read Holmes. Quite so. Now turn that up in the ledger. Holmes turned to the page indicated. Here you are, Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, Egg and Poultry Supplier, now then, what's that last entry? December 22nd, 24 geese at 7 shillings 6 pounds. Quite so. There you are, and underneath. Sold to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha at 12 shillings. What have you to say now? Sherlock Holmes looked deeply chagrined. He drew a sovereign from his pocket and threw it down upon the slab, turning away with the air of a man whose disgust is too deep for words. A few yards off, he stopped under a lamp post and laughed in the hearty, noiseless fashion which was peculiar to him. When you see a man with whiskers of that cut and the pink un protruding out of his pocket, you can always draw him by a bet, said he. I dare say that if I had put a hundred pounds down in front of him, that man would not have given me such complete information as was drawn from him by the idea that he was doing me on a wager. Well, Watson, we are, I fancy, nearing the end of our quest, and the only point which remains to be determined is whether we should go to this Mrs. Oakshot tonight, or whether we should reserve it for tomorrow. It is clear from what that surly fellow said that there are others besides ourselves who are anxious about the matter, and I should... His remarks... Oh. Sorry, one moment. <clears throat> Clear my throat.
His remarks were suddenly cut short by a loud hubbub which broke out from the stall which we had just left. Turning round, we saw a little rat-faced fellow standing in the center of the circle of yellow light which was thrown by the swinging lamp, while Breckenridge, the salesman, framed in the door of his stall, was shaking his fist fiercely at the cringing figure. "'I've had enough of you and your geese!' he shouted. "'I wish you were all at the devil together! If you come pestering me any more with your silly talk, I'll set the dog at you! You bring Mrs. Oakshot here and I'll answer her, but what have you to do with it? Did I buy the geese off of you?' No, but one of them was mine all the same, whined the little man. Well, then ask Mrs. Oakshot for it. She told me to ask you. Well, you can ask the King of Prussia for all I care. I've had enough of it. Get out of this. He rushed fiercely forward and the inquirer flitted away into the darkness. Ha! Ah, this may save us a visit to Brixton Road, whispered Holmes. Come with me and we will see what is to be made of this fellow. Striding through the scattered knots of people who lounged around the flaring stalls, my companion speedily overtook the little man and touched him upon the shoulder. He sprang round, and I could see in the gaslight that every vestige of color had been driven, in, driven from his face. Who are you, then? What do you want? He asked in a quavering voice. You will excuse me, said Holmes blandly, but I could not help overhearing the questions which you put to the salesman just now. I think that I could be of assistance to you. Y you? Who are you? How could you know anything of the matter? My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't. But you can know nothing of this. Excuse me, I know everything of it. You are endeavoring to trace some geese which were sold by Mrs. Oakshot of Brixton Road to a salesman named Breckenridge, by him in turn to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha, and by him to this club of which Mr. Henry Baker is a member. Oh, sir, you are the very man whom I have longed to meet! cried the little fellow with outstretched hands and quivering fingers. I can hardly explain to you how interested I am in this matter. Sherlock Holmes hailed a four-wheeler which was passing. In that case, we had better... <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place on the page. There we go. In that case, we had better discuss it in a cozy room rather than in this windswept marketplace, said he. But pray tell me, before we go farther, who is it that I have the pleasure of assisting? The man hesitated for an instant. My name is John Robinson, he answered with a sidelong glance. No, no, the real name, said Holmes sweetly. It is always awkward doing business with an alias. A flush sprang to the white cheeks of the stranger. Well then, said he, my real name is James Ryder. Precisely so. Head attendant at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. Pray, step into the cab, and I shall soon be able to tell you everything which you would wish to know. The little man stood glancing from one side to the other of us, with half-frightened, half-hopeful eyes, as one who is not sure whether he is on the verge of a windfall or of a catastrophe. Then he stepped into the cab, and in half an hour we were back in the sitting room at Baker Street. Nothing had been said during our drive, but the high, thin breathing of our new companion, and the claspings and unclaspings of his hands, spoke of the nervous tension within him. Here we are said Holmes, cheerily, as we filed into the room. The fire looks very seasonable in this weather. You look cold, Mr. Ryder. Pray, take the basket chair. I will just put on my slippers before we settle this little matter of yours. Now then, you want to know what became of the geese? Yes, sir. Or rather, I fancy, of that goose. It was one bird, I imagine, in which you were interested. White, with a black bar across the tail. Ryder quivered with emotion. Oh, sir, he cried, can you tell me where it went to? It came here. Here? Yes, and a most remarkable bird it proved. I don't wonder that you should take an interest in it. It laid an egg after it was dead. The bonniest, brightest little blue egg that ever was seen. I have it here in my museum. Our visitor staggered to his feet and clutched the mantelpiece with his right hand. Holmes unlocked his strong box and held up the blue carbuncle which shone out like a star with a cold, brilliant, many-pointed radiance. Ryder stood glaring with a drawn face, uncertain whether to claim or disown it. The game's up, Ryder, said Holmes quietly. Hold up, man, or you'll be into the fire. Give him arm back into his chair, Watson. He's not got blood enough to go in for felony with impunity. Give him a dash of brandy. So, now he looks a little more human. What a shrimp it is, to be sure. For a moment he had staggered and nearly fallen, but the brandy brought a tinge of color into his cheeks, and he sat staring with frightened eyes at his accuser. I have almost every link in my hand, and all the proofs which I could possibly need, so there is little which you need tell me. Still, that little may as well be cleared up to make the case complete. 
You had heard, Ryder, of this blue stone of the Countess of Morcar's. It, it, it was Catherine Cusack who told me of it, said he in a crackling voice. I see. Her ladyship's waiting maid. Well, the temptation of sudden wealth so easily acquired was too much for you, as it had been for better men before you. But you were not very scrupulous in the means you used. It seems to me, Ryder, that there is the making of a very pretty villain in you. You knew that this man Horner, the plumber, had been concerned in some such matter before, and that suspicion would rest the more readily upon him. What did you do then? You made some small job in my lady's room, you and your confederate, Cusack, and you managed that he should be the man sent for. Then, when he had left, you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm, and had this unfortunate man arrested. You then, Ryder threw himself down suddenly upon the rug and clutched at my companion's knees. For God's sake, have mercy, he shrieked. Think of my father, of my mother. It would, it would break their hearts. I never went wrong before. I never will again. I swear it. I swear it's on a Bible. Oh, don't bring it into the court. For Christ's sake, don't. Get back into your chair, said Holmes sternly. It is very well to cringe and crawl now, but you thought little enough of this poor Horner in the dock for a crime of which he knew nothing. I, I, I will fly, Mr. Holmes. I will leave the country, sir. Then the charge against him will break down. Hmm. We will talk about that. And now, let us hear a true account of the next act. How came the stone into the goose? And how came the goose into the open market? Tell us the truth, or there lies your only hope of safety. Ryder passed his tongue over parched lips. I will tell you just as it happened, sir, said he. When Horner had been arrested, it seemed to me that it would be best for me to get away with the stone at once, for I did not know which moment the police might not take it into their heads to search me and my room. There was no place about the hotel where it would be safe. I went out as if on some commission and made for my sister's house. She had married a man at Oakshot and lived in Brixton Road, where she fattened fowls for the market. All the way there, every man I met seemed to be a policeman or a detective, and for all that it was a cold night, the sweat was pouring down my face before I came to the Brixton Road. My sister asked me what was the matter and why was I so pale, but I told her that I had been upset by the jewel robbery at the hotel. Then I went into the backyard and smoked a pipe and wondered what it would be best to do. I had a friend once called Maudsley, who went to the bad and had just been serving his time in Pentonville. One day he had met me and fell into talk about the ways of thieves and how they could get rid of what they stole. I knew that he would be true to me, for I knew one or two things about him, so I made up my mind to go right to Kilburn, where he lived, and take him into my confidence. He would show me how to turn the stone into money, but how to get to him in safety. I thought of the agonies I had gone through in coming from the hotel. I might at any moment be seized and searched, and there would be the stone in my waistcoat's pocket. I was leaning against the wall at the time and looking at the geese which were waddling about round my feet, and suddenly an idea came into my head which showed me how I could beat the best detective that ever lived. My sister had told me some weeks before that I might have the pick of her goose for a Christmas present, and I knew that she was always as good as her word. I would take my goose now, and in it I would carry my stone to Kilburn. There was a little shed in the yard, and behind this I drove one of the birds, a fine big white one, a barred tail. I caught it, and prying its bill open, I thrust the stone down its throat as far as my finger could reach. The bird gave a gulp, and I felt the stone pass along its gullet and down into its crop. But the creature flapped and struggled, and out came my sister to know what was the matter. As I turned to speak to her, the brute broke loose and fluttered off among the others. "'Whatever were you doing with that bird, Jem?' says she. "'Well,' said I, "'you said you'd give me one for Christmas, and I was feeling which was the fattest.' "'Oh,' says she, "'we'll set yours aside for you. "'Jem's bird, we call it. "'A big white one over yonder. "'There's twenty-six of them, "'which makes one for you and one for us "'and two dozen for the market.' "'Thank you, Maggie,' says I, "'but if it's all the same to you, "'I'd rather have the one I was handling just now.' "'The other's a good three pound heavier,' said she, "'and we fattened it expressly for you. N "'Never mind, I'll have the other and I'll take it now,' said I. "'Well, just as you like,' said she, a little huffed. "'Which is it you want, then?' "'The white one with the barred tail, right in the middle of the flock.' Oh, very well. Kill it and take it with you. Well, I did what she said, Mr. Holmes, and I carried the bird all the way to Kilburn. I told my pal what I had done, for he was a man that it was easy to tell a thing like that to. He laughed until he choked, and we got a knife and opened the goose. My heart turned to water, for there was no sign of the stone, and I knew that some terrible mistake had occurred. I left the bird, rushed back to my sister's, and hurried into the backyard. There was not a bird to be seen there. Where are they all, Maggie? I cried. Gone to the dealer's, Jem. Which deal is? Breckenridge of Covent Garden. But there was another with a barred tail? I asked. The same as the one I chose? 
Yes, Jem, there were two bard-tailed ones, and I could never tell them apart. Well then, of course, I saw it all, and I ran off as hard as my feet would carry me to this man Breckenridge. But he had sold the lot at once, and not one word would he tell me as to where they had gone. You heard him yourselves tonight. Well, he always answered me like that. My sister thinks that I am going mad. Sometimes I think that I am myself. And now, and now I am myself a branded thief without ever having touched the wealth for which I sold my character. God, help me! God, help me! He burst into compulsive sobbing, with his face buried in his hands. There was a long silence, broken only by his heavy breathing and by the measured tapping of Sherlock Holmes' fingertips upon the edge of the table. Then my friend <clears throat> then my friend rose and threw open the door. Get out, said he. What, sir? Oh, heaven bless you. No more words. Get out. And no more words were needed. There was a rush, a clatter upon the stairs, the bang of a door, and the crisp rattle of running footfalls from the street. After all, Watson, said Holmes, reaching up his hand for his clay pipe, I am not retained by the police to supply their deficiency. If Horner were in danger, it would be another thing, but this fellow will not appear against him, and the case must collapse. I suppose that I am commuting a felony, but it is just possible that I am saving a soul. This fellow will not go wrong again. He is too terribly frightened. Send him to jail now, and you make him a jailbird for life. Besides, it is the season of forgiveness. Chance has put in our way a most singular and whimsical problem, and its solution is its own reward. If you will have the goodness to touch the bell, Doctor, we will begin another investigation, in which also a bird will be the chief feature. And that concludes the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. A wonderful jewel heist gone wrong, in which a precious gem with a history of betrayal and murder was stuffed into a goose and then lost in the streets. Though, class, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think geese have a crop. I think Sir Arthur Conan Doyle may have gotten that one wrong and should have checked. I'm not an expert on poultry, but I don't think geese have crops. However, I think that two stories will do for tonight, class. I thank you greatly for your attendance tonight and hope that you enjoyed the stories as much as I did. Ooh, actually, but the next story is the adventured. That's true. Goose is really only good to you dead. I did just realize that the next story is the adventure of the Speckled Band, which is one of the best Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm game for one more story if you are... Class. Geese don't have a crop, I was right. I mean, just say you shoved it in the goose. The effect is the same, it doesn't matter. Would people be down for one more story? Because this next one is one of the very best. It's not as if we're in danger of running out of Sherlock Holmes stories, however. <laughs> How is the neck of the goose a perfect size for the human hand? Happy coincidence. Geese are very tasty. I wonder why it's more of a British thing than an American thing. To eat geese at Christmas. Have you ever tried a uh, goose before, class? It is very tasty. True, they can be a bit tough. Toughness or gaminess in meat never, never bothers me much, particularly. I know my life was changed forever when a friend, uh, quite a long time ago, invited me over or Thanksgiving leftovers, and he was having wild turkey that he had gone out and, you know, gotten himself. And it tasted so much better than any other turkey I had ever had that it's honestly quite hard to go back to anything that's not, you know, a game turkey. It is a remarkable difference.
All right. Well, I am feeling one more story now, having seen... Yeah, he did manage to pick all of the birdshot out of it, though. That might just be because I was having the leftovers instead of the mains, but... Still an experience to be savored if you ever have the chance, class. But I think... Yeah, let's do... Let's do one more. Yeah, turkey, for me... It's not that remarkable. You know, I think we make overly big a deal of it. But, ooh, wild turkey does really taste great. So I almost never make turkey for myself because it's quite a lot of work for not a lot of reward. But let us get on with it then and the adventure of the speckled band. On glancing over my notes of the 70-odd cases in which I have, during the last eight years, studied the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I find many tragic, some comic, a large number merely strange, but none commonplace, for, working as he did rather for the love of his art than for the acquirement of wealth, he refused to associate himself with any investigation which did not tend towards the unusual and even the fantastic. Of all these varied cases, however, I cannot recall any which presented more singular features than that which was associated with the well-known Surrey family of the Roylots of Stoke Moran. The events in question occurred in the early days of my association with Holmes, when we were sharing rooms as bachelors in Baker Street. It is possible that I might have placed them upon record before, but a promise of secrecy was made at the time, from which I have only been freed during the last month by the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge was given. It is perhaps as well that the facts should now come to light, for I have reasons to know that there are widespread rumors as to the death of Dr. Grimsby Roylott, which tend to make the matter even more terrible than the truth. It was early April in the year 83 that I woke one morning to find Sherlock Holmes standing, fully dressed, by the side of my bed, he was a late riser, as a rule, and as the clock on the mantelpiece showed me that it was only a quarter past seven, I blinked up at him in some surprise, and perhaps just a little resentment, for I was myself regular in my habits. Very sorry to knock you up, Watson, said he, but it's the common lot this morning. Mrs. Hudson has been knocked up, she retorted upon me, and I on you. What is it then, a fire? No, a client. It seems that a young lady has arrived in a considerable state of excitement who insists upon seeing me. She is waiting now in the sitting room. Now, when young ladies wander about the metropolis at this hour of the morning and knock sleepy people up out of their beds, I presume that it is something very pressing which they have to communicate. Should it prove to be an interesting case, you would, I am sure, wish to follow it from the outset. I thought, at any rate, that I should call you and give you the chance. My dear fellow, I would not miss it for anything. I had no keener pleasure than in following Holmes in his professional investigations, and in admiring the rapid deductions, as swift as intuitions, and yet always founded on a logical basis with which he unraveled the problems which were submitted to him. I rapidly threw on my clothes, and was ready in a few minutes to accompany my friend down to the sitting room. A lady dressed in black and heavily veiled, who had been sitting in the window, rose as we entered. "'Good morning, madam,' said Holmes cheerily. My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my intimate friend and associate, Dr. Watson, for whom you can speak as freely as before myself. Ah, I'm glad to see that Mrs. Hudson has had the good sense to light the fire. Pray, draw up to it, and I shall order you a cup of hot coffee, for I, uh, <clears throat> for I observe that you are shivering. It is not cold which makes me shiver, said the woman in a low voice, changing her seat as requested. What then? It is fear, Mr. Holmes. It is terror. She raised her veil as she spoke, and we could see that she was indeed in a pitiable state of agitation, her face all drawn and grey, with restless, frightened eyes, like those of some hunted animal. Her features and figure were those of a woman of thirty, but her hair was shot with premature grey, and her expression was weary and haggard. Sherlock Holmes ran her over with one of his quick, quick all-comprehensive glances. "'You must not fear,' said he soothingly, bending forward and patting her forearm. We shall soon set matters right, I have no doubt. 
You have come in by train this morning, I see. You know me, then? No, but I observed the second half of a return ticket in the palm of your left glove. You must have started early, and yet you have had a good drive in a dog cart along heavy roads before you reached the station. The lady gave a violent start and stared in bewilderment at my companion. There is no mystery, my dear madam, said he, smiling. The left arm of your jacket is spattered with mud in no less than seven places. The marks are perfectly fresh. There is no vehicle save a dog cart which throws up mud in that way, and then only when you sit on the left-hand side of the driver. Whatever your reasons may be, you are perfectly correct, said she. I started from home before six, reached Leatherhead at twenty past, and came in by the first train to Waterloo. Sir, I can stand the strain no longer. I shall go mad if it continues. I have no one to turn to, none, save only one who cares for me, and he, poor fellow, can be of little aid. I have heard of you, Mr. Holmes. I have heard of you from Mrs. Farintosh, whom you helped in the hour of her sore need. It was from her that I had your address. Oh, sir, do not think that you could help me too. At least throw a little light through the dense darkness which surrounds me. At present it is out of my power to reward you for your services, but in a month or six weeks I shall be married, with the control of my own income, and then at least you shall not find me ungrateful. Holmes turned to his desk, and unlocking it, drew out a small case book, which he consulted. Ah, Farintosh, said he. Ah, yes, I recall the case. It was concerned with an opal tiara. I think it was before your time, Watson. I can only say, madam, that I shall be happy to devote the same care to your case as I did to that of your friend. As to reward, my profession is its own reward, but you are at liberty to defray whatever expenses I may be put to at the time which suits you best. And now, I beg that you will lay before us everything that may help us in forming an opinion upon the matter. Alas, replied our visitor, the very horror of my situation lies in the fact that my fears are so vague, and my suspicions depend so entirely upon small points, which might seem trivial to another, that even he to whom of all others I have a right to look for help and advice looks upon all that I tell him about it as the fancies of a nervous woman. He does not say so, but I can read it from his soothing answers and diverted eyes. But I have heard, Mr. Holmes, that you can see deeply into the manifold wickedness of the human heart. You may advise me how to walk amid the dangers which encompass me. I am all attention, madam. My name is Helen Stoner, and I am living with my stepfather, who is the last survivor of one of the oldest Saxon families in England, the Roylots of Stoke Moran on the western border of Surrey. Holmes nodded his head. The name is familiar to me, said he. The family was at one time among the richest in England, and the, ex the estates extended over the borders into Berkshire in the north and Hampshire in the west. In the last century, however, four successive heirs were of a dissolute and wasteful disposition, and the family ruin was eventually completed by a gambler in the days of the Regency. Nothing was left save a few acres of ground and the 200-year-old house, which is itself crushed under a heavy mortgage. The last squire dragged out his existence there, living the horrible life of an aristocratic pauper. But his only son, my stepfather, seeing that he must adapt himself to the new conditions, obtained an advance from a relative which enabled him to take a medical degree, and went out to Calcutta, where, by his professional skill and his force of character, he established a large practice. In a fit of anger, however, caused by some robberies which had been perpetrated in the house, he beat his native butler to death and narrowly escaped a capital sentence. As it was, he suffered a long term of imprisonment, and afterwards returned to England a morose and disappointed man. When Dr. Roylett was in India, he married my mother, Mrs. Stoner, the young widow of Major General Stoner, of the Bengal Artillery. My sister Julia and I were twins, and we were only two years old at the time of my mother's remarriage. We had a considerable sum of money, not less than a thousand pounds a year, and this she bequeathed to Dr. Roylett entirely while we resided with him, with a provision that a certain annual sum should be allowed to each of us in the event of our marriage. Shortly after our return to England, my mother died. She was killed eight years ago in a railway accident near Crewe. Dr. Roylett then abandoned his attempts to establish himself in practice in London, and took us to live with him in the old ancestral house at Stoke Moran. The money which my mother had left was enough for all our wants, and there seemed to be no obstacle to our happiness. But a terrible change came over our stepfather about this time. Instead of making friends and exchanging visits with our neighbours, who had at first been overjoyed to see a Roylett of Stoke Moran back in the old family seat, he shut himself up in his house and seldom came out save to indulge in ferocious quarrels with whoever might cross his path. Violence of temper approaching to mania has been hereditary in the men of the family, and in my stepfather's case it had, I believe, been intensified by his long residence in the tropics. 
a series of disgraceful brawls took place, two of which ended in the police court, until at last he became the terror of the village, and the folks would fly at his approach, for he is a man of immense strength, absolutely uncontrollable in his anger. Last week, he hurled the local blacksmith over a parapet into a stream. It was only by paying over all the money which I could gather together that I was able to avert another public exposure. He had no friends at all save the wandering gypsies, and he would give these vagabonds leave to encamp upon the few acres of brambled-covered land which represent the family estate, and would accept in return the hospitality of their tents, wandering away with them sometimes for weeks on end. He has a passion also for Indian animals, which are sent over to him by a correspondent, and he has at this moment a cheetah and a baboon, which wanders freely over his grounds and are feared by the villagers almost as much as their master. You can imagine from what I say that my poor sister Julie and I had no great pleasure in our lives. No servant would stay with us, and for a long time we did all the work of the house. She was but thirty at the time of her death, and yet her hair had already begun to whiten, even as mine has. Your sister is dead, then. She died just two years ago, and it is of her death that I wish to speak to you. You can understand that, living the life which I have described, we were little likely to see anyone of our own age and position. We had, however, an aunt, my mother's maiden sister, Miss Honoria Westphale, who lives near Harrow, and we were occasionally allowed to pay short visits at this lady's house. Julia went there at Christmas two years ago, and met there a half-pay major of marines to whom she became engaged. My stepfather learned of the engagement when my sister returned and offered no objection to the marriage. But within a fortnight of the day which had been fixed for the wedding, a terrible event occurred which has deprived me of my only companion. Sherlock Holmes had been leaning back in his chair with his eyes closed and his head sunk in a cushion, but he half opened his lids now and glanced across at his visitor. Pray, be precise as to details, said he. It is easy for me to be so, for every event of that dreadful time is seared into my memory. The manor house is, as I have already said, very old, and only one wing is now inhabited. The bedrooms in this wing are on the ground floor, sitting rooms being in the central block of the buildings. Of these bedrooms, the first is Dr. Roylet's, the second my sister's, and the third my own. There is no communication between them, but they all open out into the same corridor. Do I make myself perfectly plain? Perfectly so. The windows of the three rooms open out upon the lawn. That fatal night Dr. Roylet had gone to his room early, though we knew though we knew that he had not retired to rest, for my sister was troubled by the smell of the strong Indian cigars which it was his custom to smoke. She left her room, therefore, and came into mine, where she sat for some time, chatting about her approaching wedding. At eleven o'clock she rose to leave me, but she paused at the door and looked back. "'Tell me, Helen,' said she, "'have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of the night?' "'Never,' said I. "'I suppose that you could not possibly whistle yourself in your sleep?' "'Certainly not. But why?' "'Because during these last few nights I have always, about three in the morning, heard a low, clear whistle.' I am a light sleeper, and it has awakened me. I cannot tell where it came from, perhaps the next room, perhaps from the lawn. I thought I would just ask you whether you had heard it. Oh. Sorry about that. I think I may have lost connection for a second. Where was I? Oh, it skipped the deal there. Sorry, so the sisters, Julia and Helen, were just talking about a whistle in the dead of night. Tell me, Helen, said she, have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of night? Never, said I. I suppose that you could not possibly whistle yourself in your sleep. Certainly not. But why? Because during the last few nights I have always, about three in the morning, heard a low, clear whistle. I am a light sleeper, and it has awakened me. I cannot tell where it came from, perhaps from the next room, perhaps from the lawn. I thought that I would just ask you whether you had heard it. No, I have not. It must be those wretched gypsies in the plantation. Very likely. And yet, if it were on the lawn, I wonder that you did not hear it also. Ah, but I sleep more heavily than you. Well, it is of no great consequence at any rate. She smiled back at me, closed my door, and a few moments later I heard her key turn in the lock. Indeed, said Holmes. Was it always... Was it your custom always to lock yourselves in at night? Always. And why? I think I mentioned to you that the doctor kept a cheetah and a baboon. We had no feeling of security unless our doors were locked. Quite so. Pray, proceed with your statement. I could not sleep that night. 
A vague feeling of impending misfortune impressed me. My sister and I, you will recollect, were twins, and you know how subtle are the links which bind two souls which are so closely allied. It was a wild night. The wind was howling outside, and the rain was beating and splashing against the windows. Suddenly, amid all the hubbub of the gale, there burst forth the wild scream of a terrified woman. I knew that it was my sister's voice. I sprang from my bed, wrapped a shawl round me, and rushed into the corridor. As I opened my door, I seemed to hear a low whistle, such as my sister described, and a few moments later a clanging sound, as if a mass of metal had fallen. As I ran down the passage, my sister's door was unlocked, and revolved slowly upon its hinges. I stared at it horror-stricken, not knowing what was about to issue from it. By the light of the corridor lamp, I saw my sister appear at the opening, her face blanched with terror, her hands groping for hel help, her whole figure swaying to and fro like that of a drunkard. I ran to her and threw my arms round her, but at that moment her knees seemed to give way and she fell to the ground. She writhed as one who was in terrible pain and her limbs were dreadfully convulsed. At first I thought that she had not recognized me, but as I bent over her she suddenly shrieked out in a voice which I shall never forget. Oh my god, Helen, it was the band, the speckled band. There was something else which she would fain have said as she stabbed with her finger into the air in the direction of the doctor's room, but a fresh convulsion seized her and choked her words. I rushed out, calling loudly for my stepfather, but I met him hastening from his room in his dressing gown. When he reached my sister's side, she was unconscious, and though he poured brandy down her throat and sent for medical aid in the village, all efforts were in vain, for she slowly sank and died without having recovered her consciousness. Such was the dreadful end of my beloved sister. One moment, said Holmes. Are you sure about this whistle and metallic sound? Would you swear to it? That was what the county coroner asked me at the inquiry. It is my strong impression that I heard it, and yet, among the crash of the gale and the creaking of an old house, I may possibly have been deceived. Deceived? Was your sister dressed? No, she was in her nightdress. In her right hand was found the charred stump of a match, and in her left a matchbox. Showing that he had showing that she had struck a light and looked about her when the alarm took place. That is important. And what conclusions did the coroner come to? He investigated the case with great care, for Dr. Roylott's conduct had been long notorious in the county, but he was unable to find any satisfactory cause of death. My evidence showed that the door had been fastened upon the inner side, and the windows were blocked by old-fashioned shutters with broad iron bars, which were secured every night. The walls were carefully sounded, and were shown to be quite solid all round, and the flooring was also thoroughly examined, with the same result. The chimney is wide, but is barred up by four large staples. It is certain, therefore, that my sister was quite alone when she met her end. Besides, there were no marks of any violence upon her. How about poison? Doctors examined her for it, but without success. What do you think this unfortunate lady died of, then? It is my belief that she died of pure fear and nervous shock, but what it was that frightened her I cannot imagine. Were there gypsies in the plantation at the time? Yes, there are nearly always some there. Ah, and what did you gather from this allusion to a band, a speckled band? Sometimes I have thought that it was merely the wild talk of delirium, sometimes that it may have referred to some band of people, perhaps to those very gypsies in the plantation. I do not know whether the spotted handkerchiefs which so many of them wear over their heads might have suggested the strange ad adjective which she used. Holmes shook his man Holmes shook his head like a man who was far from being satisfied. These are very deep waters, said he. Pray, go on with your narrative. Two years have passed since then, and my life has been until lately lonelier than ever. A month ago, however, a dear friend, whom I have known for many years, has done me the honor to ask my hand in marriage. His name is Armitage, Percy Armitage, the second son of Mr. Armitage, of Crane Water, near Reading. My stepfather has offered no opposition to the match, and we are to be married in the course of spring. Two days ago, some repairs were started in the west wing of the building, and my bedroom wall has been pierced so that I have had to move into the chamber in which my sister died, and to sleep in the very bed in which she slept. Imagine then my thrill of terror when last night, as I lay awake thinking over her terrible fate, I suddenly heard in the silence of the night the low whistle which had been the herald of her own death. I sprang up and lit the lamp, but nothing was to be seen in the room. I was too shaken to go to bed again, however, so I dressed, and as soon as it was daylight, I slipped down, got a dog cart at the Crown Inn, which is opposite, and drove to Leatherhead, from whence I came 
on this morning with the one object of seeing you and asking your advice. You have done wisely, said my friend, but have you told me all? Yes, all. Miss Roylet, you have not. You are screening your stepfather. Why? What do you mean? For answer, Holmes pushed back the frill of black lace which fringed the hand that lay upon our visitor's knee. Five little livid spots, the marks of four fingers and a thumb, were printed upon the white wrist. You have been cruelly used, said Holmes. The lady colored deeply and covered over her injured wrist. He is a hard man, she said, and perhaps he hardly knows his own strength. There was a long silence, during which Holmes leaned his chin upon his hands and stared into the crackling fire. This is a very deep business, he said at last. There are a thousand details which I should desire to know before I decide upon our course of action. Yet we have not a moment to lose. If we were to come to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible for us to see over these rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? As it happens, he spoke of coming into town today upon some most important business. It is probable that he will be away all day and that there would be nothing to disturb you. We have a housekeeper now, but she is old and foolish, and I could easily get her out of the way. Excellent. You are not averse to this trip, Watson? By no means. Then we shall both come. What are you going to do yourself? I have one or two things which I would wish to do now that I am in town. But I shall return by the twelve o'clock train so as to be there in time for your coming. And you may expect us early in the afternoon. I have myself some small business matters to attend to. Will you not wait and breakfast? No, I must go. My heart is lightened already since I have confided my trouble to you. I shall look forward to seeing you again this afternoon. She dropped her thick black veil over her face and glided from the room. And what do you think of it all, Watson? Asked Sherlock Holmes, leaning back in his chair. It seems to me to be a most dark and sinister business. Dark and sinister enough indeed. Yet if the lady is correct in saying that the flooring and walls are sound, and that the door, window, and chimney are impassable, then her sister must have been undoubtedly alone when she met her mysterious end. What becomes then of these nocturnal whistles, and what of the very peculiar words of the dying woman? I cannot think. When you combine the ideas of whistles at night, the presence of a band of gypsies who are on intimate terms with this old doctor, the fact that we have every reason to believe that the doctor has an interest in preventing his stepdaughter's marriage, the dying allusion to a band, and finally the fact that Miss Helen Stoner heard a metallic clang which might have been caused by one of the metal bars that secured the shutters falling back into its place, I think that there is good ground to think that the mystery may be cleared along those lines. But what then did the gypsies do? I cannot imagine. I see many objections to any such theory. And so do I. It is precisely for that reason that we are going to Stoke Moran this day. I want to see whether the objections are fatal or if they may be explained away. But what in the name of the devil? The ejaculation had been drawn from my companion by the fact that our door had been suddenly dashed open and that a huge man had framed himself in the aperture. His costume was a peculiar mixture of the professional and of the agricultural, having a black top hat, a long frock coat, and a pair of high gaiters with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. So tall was he that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway, and his breadth seemed to span it across from side to side. A large face, seared with a thousand wrinkles, burned yellow with the sun, and marked us with every evil passion, was turned from one to the other of us, while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes, and his high, thin, fleshless nose, gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. "'Which one of you is Holmes?' asked this apparition. My name, sir, but you have the advantage of me, said my companion quietly. I am Dr. Grimesby Roylet of Stoke Moran. Indeed, doctor, said Holmes blandly. Pray, take a seat. I will do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I have traced her. What has she been saying to you? It is a little cold for this time of year, said Holmes. What has she been saying to you? screamed the old man furiously. But I have heard the crocuses promise well, continued my companion imperturb <laughs> imperturbably. Ha! You put me off, do you? said our new visitor, taking a step forward and shaking his hunting crop. I know you, you scoundrel. I have heard of you before. You are Holmes the meddler. My friend smiled. Holmes the busybody. His smile broadened. 
Holmes, the Scotland Yard Jack in office. Holmes chuckled heartily. Your conversation is most entertaining, said he. When you go out, close the door, for there's a decided draft. I will go when I have had my say. Don't you dare to meddle with my affairs. I know that Miss Stoner has been here. I traced her. I am a dangerous man to fall foul of. See here! He stepped swiftly forward, seized the poker, and bent it into a curve with his huge brown hands. See that you keep yourself out of my grip, he snarled, and hurling the twisted poker into the fireplace, he strode out of the room. He seems a very amiable person, said Holmes, laughing. I am not quite so bulky, but if, if he had remained, I might have shown him that my grip was not much more feeble than his own. As he spoke, he picked up the steel poker, and with a sudden effort, straightened it out again. Fancy his having the insolence to confound me with the official detective force. This incident gives zest to our investigation, however, and I only trust that our little friend will not suffer from her impudence in allowing this brute to trace her. And now, Watson, we shall order breakfast, and afterwards I shall walk down to Doctor's Commons, where I hope to get some data which may help us in this matter. It was nearly one o'clock when Sherlock Holmes returned from his excursion. He held in his hand a sheet of blue paper, scrawled over with notes and figures. I have seen the will of the deceased wife, said he. To determine its exact meaning, I have been obliged to work out the present prices of the investments with which it is concerned. Total income, which at the time of the wife's death was little short of eleven hundred pounds, is now, through the fall in agricultural prices, not more than seven hundred fifty pounds. Each daughter can claim an income of £250 in case of marriage. It is evident, therefore, that if both girls had married, this beauty would have had a mere pittance, while even one of them would cripple him to a very serious extent. My morning's work has not been wasted, since it has proved that he has the very strongest motives for standing in the way of anything of the sort. And now, Watson, this is too serious for dawdling, especially as the old man is aware that we are interesting ourselves in his affairs. So. If you are ready, we shall call a cab and drive to Waterloo. I should be very much obliged if you would slip your revolver into your pocket. An Elay's number two is an excellent argument with gentlemen who can twist steel pokers into knots. That and a toothbrush are, I think, all we need. At Waterloo, we were fortunate in catching a train for Leatherhead, where we hired a trap at the station inn and drove for four or five miles through the lovely Surrey lanes. It was a perfect day, with a bright sun and a few fleecy clouds in the heavens. The trees and wayside hedges were just throwing out their first green shoots, and the air was full of the pleasant smell of the moist earth. To me, at least, there was a strange contrast between the sweet promise of the spring and this sinister quest upon which we were engaged. My companion sat in the front of the trap, his arms folded, his hat pulled down over his eyes, and his chin sunk upon his breast, buried in the deepest thought. Suddenly, however, he started, tapped me on the shoulder, and pointed over the meadows. Look there, said he. A heavily timbered park stretched up in a gentle slope, thickening into a grove at the highest point. From amid the branches there jutted out the grey gables and high roof tree, a very old mansion. Stoke Moran, said he. Yes, sir, that be the house of Dr. Grimesby Roylet, remarked the driver. There is some sort of building going on there, said Holmes. That is where we are going. There's the village, said the driver, pointing to a cluster of roofs some distance to the left. But if you want to get to the house, you'll find it shorter to get over the stile, and so by the footpath over the fields. There it is, where the lady is walking. And the lady, I fancy, is Miss Stoner, observed Holmes, shading his eyes. Yes, I think we had better do as you suggest. We got off, paid our fare, and the trap rattled back on its way to Leatherhead. I thought it as well, said Holmes as we climbed the stile, that this fellow should think we had come here as architects or on some definite business. It may stop his gossip. Good afternoon, Miss Stoner. You see that we have been as good as our word. Our client of the morning had hurried forward to meet us with a face which spoke her joy. I have been waiting so eagerly for you, she cried, shaking hands with us warmly. All has turned out splendidly. Dr. Roylet has gone to town, and it is unlikely he will be back before evening. We have had the pleasure of making the doctor's acquaintance, said Holmes, and in a few words he sketched out what had occurred. Miss Stoner turned white to the lips as she listened. "'Good heavens!' she cried. "'He has followed me, then.' "'So it appears. "'He is so cunning that I never know when I am safe from him. "'What will he say when he returns?' "'He must guard himself, for he may find that there is someone more cunning than himself upon his track. "'You must lock yourself up from him tonight. 
If he is violent, we shall take you away to your aunt's at Harrow. Now, we must make the best use of our time, so kindly take us at once to the rooms which we are to examine. The building was of grey, lichen-blotched stone, with a high central portion and two curving wings, like the claws of a crab, thrown out on each side. In one of these wings, the windows were broken and blocked with wooden boards, while the roof was partly caved in, a picture of ruin. The central portion was in little better repair, but the right-hand block was comparatively modern, and the blinds in the windows, with the blue smoke curling up from the chimneys, showed that this was where the family resided. Some scaffolding had been erected against the end wall, and the stonework had been broken into, but there were no signs of any workmen at the moment of our visit. Holmes walked slowly up and down the ill-trimmed lawn, and examined with deep attention the outsides of the windows. This, I take it, belongs to the room in which you used to sleep, the center one to your sister's, and the next to the main building to Dr. Roylet's chamber. Exactly so, but I am now sleeping in the middle one, pending the alterations as I understand. By the way, there does not seem to be very... <clears throat> By the way, there does not seem to be any very pressing need for repairs at that end wall. There were none. I believe that it was an excuse to move me from my room. Ah, that is suggestive. Now, on the other side of this narrow wing runs the corridor from which these three rooms open. There are windows in it, of course. Yes, but very small ones, too narrow for anyone to pass through. As you both locked your doors at night, your rooms were unapproachable from that side. Now, would you have the kindness to go into your room and bar your shutters? Miss Stoner did so, and Holmes, after a careful examination through the open window, endeavored in every way to force the shutter open, but without success. There was no slit through which a knife could be passed to raise the bar. Then, with his lens, he tested the hinges, but they were of solid iron, built firmly into the massive masonry. Hmm said he, scratching his chin in some perplexity. My theory certainly presents some difficulties. No one could pass these shutters if they were bolted. Well, we shall see if the inside throws any light upon the matter. A small side door led into the whitewashed corridor from which the three bedrooms opened. Holmes refused to examine the third chamber, so he passed at once to the second, that in which Miss Stoner was now sleeping, and in which her sister had met with her fate. It was a homely little room, with a low ceiling and a gaping fireplace, after the fashion of old country houses. A brown chest of drawers stood in one corner, a narrow, white, counterpaned bed in another, and a dressing table on the left-hand side of the window. These articles, with two small wickerwork chairs, made up all the furniture in the room, save for a square of Wilton carpet in the center. The boards round and the paneling of the walls were of brown, worm-eaten oak, so old and discolored that it may have dated from the original building of the house. Holmes drew one of the chairs into a corner and sat silent, while his eyes traveled round and round, and up and down, taking in every detail of the apartment. Where does that bell communicate with? He asked at last, pointing to a thick bell rope which hung down beside the bed, the tassel actually lying upon the pillow. It goes to the housekeeper's rooms. It looks newer than the other things? Yes, it was only put there a couple years ago. Your sister asked for it, I suppose. No, I never heard of her using it. We used always to get what we wanted for ourselves. Indeed, it seemed so unnecessary to put a bell pole there. You'll excuse me for a few minutes while I satisfy, satisfy myself as to this floor. He threw himself down upon his face with his lens in his hand and crawled swiftly backward and forward, examining minutely the cracks between the boards. Then he did the same with the woodwork with which the chamber was paneled. Finally, he walked over to the bed and spent some time in staring at it and running his eye up and down the wall. Finally, he took the bell rope in his hand and gave it a brisk tug. Why, it's a dummy, said he. Won't it ring? No, it is not even attached to a wire. This is very interesting. You can see now that it is fastened to a hook, just above where the little opening for the ventilator is. Oh, very absurd. I never noticed that before. Very strange, muttered Holmes, pulling at the rope. There are two or one or two very singular points about this room. For example, what a fool builder must be to open a ventilator into another room when, with the same trouble, he might have communicated with the outside air. That is also quite modern, said the lady. Done about the same time as the bell rope, marked Holmes. Yes, there were several little changes carried out about that time. They seem to have been of a most interesting character. Dummy, bell ropes, and ventilators which do not ventilate? With your permission, Miss Stoner, we shall now carry our researches into the inner apartment. 
Dr. Grimesby Roylet's chamber was larger than that of his stepdaughter, but was as plainly furnished. A camp bed, a small wooden shelf full of books, mostly of a technical character, an armchair beside the bed, a plain wooden chair against the wall, a round table, and a large iron safe were the principal things which met the eye. Holmes walked slowly round and examined each and all of them with the keenest interest. "'What's in here?' he asked, tapping the safe. "'My stepfather's business papers.' "'Oh, you've seen inside, then?' "'Only once, some years ago. I remember that it was full of papers.' "'There isn't a cat in it, for example?' "'No. What, what a strange idea.' "'Well, look at this.' He took up a small saucer of milk which stood on the top of it. "'No, we don't keep a cat, but there is a cheetah and a baboon.' "'Ah, yes, of course. Well, a cheetah is just a big cat, and yet a saucer of milk does not go very far in satisfying its wants, I dare say. There is one point which I should wish to determine.' He squatted down in front of the wooden chair and examined the seat of it with the greatest attention. "'Thank you. That is quite settled,' said he, rising and putting his lens in his pocket. Hello, here's something interesting. The object which had caught his eye was a small dog lash hung up on one corner of the bed. The lash, however, was curled upon itself and tied so as to make a loop of whipcord. What do you make of that, Watson? It's common enough lash, but I don't know why it should be tied. That is not quite so common, is it? Ah, me, it's a wicked world, and when a clever man turns his brains to crime, it is the worst of all. I think that I have seen enough now, Miss Stoner, and with your permission we should walk out upon the lawn. I had never seen my friend's face so grim or his brow so dark as it was when we turned from the scene of this investigation. We had walked several times up and down the lawn, neither Miss Stoner nor myself liking to break in upon his thoughts before he roused himself from his reverie. It is very essential, Miss Stoner, said he, that you should absolutely follow my advice in every respect. I shall most certainly do so. The matter is too serious for any hesitation. Your life may depend upon your compliance. I assure you that I am in your hands. In the first place, both my friend and I must spend the night in your room. Both Miss Stoner and I gazed at him in astonishment. Yes, it must be so. Let me explain. I believe that that is the village inn over there. Yes, that is the crown. Very good. Your windows would be visible from there? Certainly. You must confine yourself to your room on pretense of a headache when your stepfather comes back. Then, when you hear him retire for the night, you must open the shutters of your window, undo the hasp, put your lamp there as a signal to us, and then withdraw quietly with everything which, which you are likely to want into the room which you used to occupy. I have no doubt that, in spite of the repairs, you could manage there for one night. Oh, yes, easily. The rest you will leave in our hands. But what will you do? We shall spend the night in your room, and we shall investigate the cause of this noise which has disturbed you. I believe, Mr. Holmes, that you have already made up your mind, said Miss Stoner, laying her hand upon my companion's sleeve. Perhaps I have. Then, for pity's sake, tell me what was the cause of my sister's death. I should prefer to have clearer proofs before I speak. You can at least tell me whether my own thought is correct and if she died from some sudden fright. No, I do not think so. I think that there was probably some more tangible cause. And now, Miss Stoner, we must leave you, for if Dr. Roylet returned and saw us, our journey would be in vain. Goodbye, and be brave, for if you do, for if you will do what I have told you, you may rest assured that we shall soon drive away the dangers that threaten you. Sherlock Holmes and I had no difficulty in engaging a bedroom and sitting room at the Crown Inn. They were on the upper floor, and from our window we could command a view of the avenue gate and of the inhabited wing of Stoke Moran Manor House. At dusk, we saw Dr. Grimesby Roylet drive past, his huge form looming up beside the little figure of the lad who drove him. The boy had some slight difficulty in undoing the heavy iron gates, and we heard the hoarse roar of the doctor's voice and saw the fury with which he shook his clenched fists at him. The trap drove on and a few minutes later we saw a sudden light spring up among the trees as the lamp was lit in one of the sitting room. "'Do you know, Watson?' said Holmes as we sat together in the gathering darkness. "'I have really some scruples as to taking you tonight. There is a distinct element of danger. Can I be of assistance? Your presence might be invaluable.' "'Then I shall certainly come. It is very kind of you. You speak of danger. You have evidently seen more in these rooms than was visible to me.' "'No.' 
but I fancy that I may have deduced a little more. I imagine that you saw all that I did. I saw nothing remarkable save the bell rope, and what purpose that could answer I confess is more than I can imagine. You saw the ventilator, too? Yes, but I do not think that it is such a very unusual thing as to have a small opening between two rooms. It was so small that a rat could hardly pass through. I knew that we should find a ventilator before ever we came to Stoke Moran. My dear Holmes, oh yes, I did. You remember in her statement she said that her sister could smell Dr. Roylet's cigar. Now, of course, that suggested at once that there must be a communication between the two rooms. It could only be a small one, or it would have been remarked upon at the coroner's inquiry. I deduced a ventilator. But what harm can there be in that? Well, there is at least a curious coincidence of dates. A ventilator is made, a cord is hung, and a lady who sleeps in the bed dies. Does that not strike you? I cannot as yet see any connection. Did you observe anything peculiar about that bed? No. It was clamped to the floor. Did you ever see a bed fastened like that before? I cannot say that I have. The lady could not move her bed. It must always be in the same relative position to the ventilator and to the rope, or so we may call it since it was clearly never meant for a bell pull. Holmes, I cried, I seem to see dimly what you are hinting at. We are only just in time to prevent some subtle and horrible crime. Subtle enough and horrible enough. When a doctor does go wrong, he is the first of criminals. He has nerve and he has knowledge. Palmer and Pritchard were among the heads of their profession. This man strikes even deeper, but I think, Watson, that we shall be able to strike deeper still. But we shall have horrors enough before the night is over. For goodness sake, let us have a quiet pipe and turn our minds over to a few hours to something more cheerful. About nine o'clock, the light among the trees was extinguished, and all was dark in the direction of the manor house. Two hours passed slowly away, and then suddenly, just at the stroke of eleven, a single bright light shone out right in front of us. That is our signal, said Holmes, springing to his feet. It comes from the middle window. As we passed out, he exchanged a few words with the landlord, explaining that we were going on a late visit to an acquaintance, and that it was possible that we might spend the night there. A moment later, we were out on the dark road, a chill wind blowing in our faces, and one yellow light twinkling in front of us through the gloom to guide us on our somber errand. There was little difficulty in entering the grounds, for unrepaired breaches gaped in the old park wall. Making our way among the trees, we reached the lawn, crossed it, and we were about to enter through the window when out from a, crump of, uh, out from a clump of laurel bushes there darted what seemed to be a hideous and distorted child it threw itself upon the grass with writhing limbs and then ran swiftly across the lawn into the darkness. My God, I whispered. Did you see it? Holmes was for the moment as startled as I. His hand closed like a vice upon my wrist in his agitation. Then he broke into a low laugh and put his lips to my ear. It is a nice household, he murmured. That is the baboon. I had forgotten the strange pets which the doctor affected. There was a cheetah, too. Perhaps we might find it upon our shoulders at any moment. I confess that I felt easier in my mind when, after following Holmes's example and slipping off my shoes, I found myself inside the bedroom. My companion noiselessly closed the shutters, moved the lamp onto the table, cast his eyes round the room. All was as we had seen it in the daytime. Then, creeping up to me, making a trumpet of his hand, he whispered into my ear again so gently that it was all that I could do to distinguish the word. The least sound would be fatal to our plan. I nodded to show that I had heard. We must sit without light. See it through the ventilator. I nodded again. Do not go asleep. Your very life may depend upon it. Have your pistol ready in case we should need it. I will sit on the side of the bed, and you in that chair. I took out my revolver and laid it on the corner of the table. Holmes had brought up a long, thin cane and this he placed on the bed beside him. By it, he laid the box of matches and the stump of a candle. Then he turned down the lamp. We were left in darkness. How shall I ever forget that dreadful vigil? I could not hear a sound, not even the drawing of a breath, and yet I knew that my companion sat open-eyed within a few feet of me, in the same state of nervous tension in which I was myself. The shutters caught off the least ray of light, and we waited in absolute darkness. 
From outside came the occasional cry of a night bird, and once at our very window a long-drawn cat-like whine, which told us that the cheetah was indeed at liberty. Far away we could hear the deep tones of the parish clock, which boomed out every quarter of an hour. How long they seemed, those quarters! Twelve struck, and one, and two, three, and still we sat waiting silently for whatever might befall. Suddenly, there was the momentary gleam of a light up in the direction of the ventilator, which vanished immediately, what was succeeded by a strong smell of burning oil and heated metal. Someone in the next room had lit a dark lantern. I heard a gentle sound of movement, and then all was silent once more, though the smell grew stronger. For half an hour I sat with straining ears. Then suddenly, another sound became audible. A very gentle, soothing sound, like that of a small jet of steam escaping continually from a kettle. The instant that we heard it, Holmes sprang from the bed, struck a match, and lashed furiously with his cane at the bell pole. You see it, Watson! he yelled. You see it! But I saw nothing. At the moment when Holmes struck the light, I heard a low, clear whistle, but the sudden glare flashing into my weary eyes made it impossible for me to tell what it was which my friend lashed so savagely. I could, however, see that his face was deadly pale and filled with horror and loathing. He had ceased to strike and was gazing up at the ventilator, when suddenly there broke from the silence of the night the most horrible cry to which I have ever listened. It swelled up louder and louder, a hoarse yell of pain and fear and anger all mingled in the one dreadful shriek. They say that away down in the village and even in the distant parsonage, that cry raised the sleepers from their beds. It struck cold to our hearts, and I stood gazing at Holmes and he at me, until the last echoes of it had died away into the silence from which it rose. "'What can it mean?' I gasped. "'It means that it is all over,' Holmes answered. "'And perhaps, after all, it is for the best. "'Take your pistol, and we'll enter Dr. Roylet's room.' With a grave face, he lit the lamp and led the way down the corridor. Twice he struck at the chamber door without any reply from within. Then he turned the handle and entered. I at his heels, with the cocked pistol in my hand. It was a singular sight which met our eyes. On the table stood a dark lantern with the shutter half open, throwing a brilliant beam of light upon the iron safe, the door of which was ajar. Beside this table, on the wooden chair, sat Dr. Grimesby Roylet, clad in a long grey dressing gown, his bare ankle protruding beneath, and his feet thrust into red heelless Turkish slippers. Across his lap lay the short stock with the long lash which we had noticed during the day. His chin was cocked upward and his eyes were fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling. Round his brow he had a peculiar yellow band with brownish speckles which seemed to be bound tightly round his head. As we entered he made neither sound nor motion. The band! The speckled band! whispered Holmes. I took a step forward. In an instant, his strange headgear began to move, and there reared itself from among his hair the squat, diamond-shaped head and puffed neck of a loathsome serpent. "'This is Swamp Adder!' cried Holmes. "'The deadliest snake in India. He has died within ten seconds of being bitten. Violence does, in truth, recoil upon the violent, and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Let us thrust this creature back into its den, and we can then remove Miss Stoner to some place of shelter, and let the county police know what has happened.' As he spoke, he drew the dog whip swiftly from the dead man's lap, and throwing the noose round the reptile's neck, he drew it from its horrid perch, and carrying it at arm's length, threw it into the iron safe which he closed upon it. Such are the true facts of the death of Dr. Grimesby Roylet of Stoke Moran. It is not necessary that I should prolong a narrative which has already run to too great a length by telling how we broke the sad news to the terrified girl, how we conveyed her by the morning train to the care of her good aunt at Harrow, of how the slow process of official inquiry came to the conclusion that the doctor met his fate while indiscreetly playing with a dangerous pet. The little which I had yet to learn of the case was told to me by Sherlock Holmes as we travelled back next day. I had, said he, come to an entirely erroneous conclusion, which shows, my dear Watson, how dangerous it always is to reason from insufficient data. The presence of the gypsies and the use of the word band, which was used by the poor girl, no doubt, to explain the appearance which she had caught a hurried glimpse of by the light of her match, were sufficient to put me upon an entirely wrong scent. 
I can only claim the merit that I instantly reconsidered my position when, however, it became clear to me that whatever danger threatened an occupant of the room could not come either from the window or the door. My attention was speedily drawn, as I have already remarked to you, to this ventilator, and to the bell rope which hung down to the bed. The discovery that this was a dummy, and that the bed was clamped to the floor, instantly gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was there as a bridge for something, passing through the hole and coming to the bed. The idea of a snake instantly occurred to me, and when I coupled it with my knowledge that the doctor was furnished with a supply of creatures from India, I felt that I was probably on the right track. The idea of using a form of poison which could not possibly be discovered by any chemical test was just such a one as would occur to a clever and ruthless man who had had an eastern training. The rapidity with which such a poison would take effect would also, from his point of view, be an advantage. It would be a sharp-eyed coroner indeed who could distinguish the two little dark punctures which would show where the poison fangs had done their work. Then I thought of the whistle. Of course, he must recall the snake before the morning light revealed it to the victim. He had trained it, probably by the use of the milk which we saw, to return to him when summoned. He would put it through the ventilator at the hour that he thought best, with the certainty that it would crawl down the rope and land on the bed. It might or might not bite the occupant. Perhaps she might escape every night for a week, but sooner or later she must fall a victim. I had come to these conclusions before ever I had entered his room. An inspection of his chair showed me that he had been in the habit of standing on it, which of course would be necessary in order that he should reach the ventilator. The sight of the safe, the saucer of milk, and the loop of whipcord were enough to finally dispel any doubts which may have remained. The metallic clang heard by Miss Stoner was obviously caused by her stepfather hastily closing the door of his safe upon its terrible occupant. Having once made up my mind, you know the steps which I took in order to put the matter to proof. I heard the creature hiss as I have had no doubt you also did, and I instantly lit the light and attacked it, with the result of driving it through the ventilator and also with the result of causing it to turn upon its master at the other side. Some of the blows of my cane came home and roused its snakish temper, so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way, I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimesby Roylet's death, and I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily upon my conscience. And so, class, concludes the case of the Speckled Band. Speckled Band being a terrible poison snake snuck through a ventilator to kill a stepdaughter and prevent them taking the income of a wicked doctor away. It is a classic locked room mystery case, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. That was a particularly fun one to read. Of course, it wasn't very hard to reason out, I don't think, though the red herrings with the cheetah, the baboon, the band of gypsies, all are wonderful misdirection. So class, I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. They were very fun for me to read, and I hope they were as fun for you to listen to. Locked Room Mysteries are very fun, and I think this is up there with the best of them. Not that it's hard to figure out, but that it's all reasonably logically sound. Let's see. Before we conclude tonight, class, I just want to let you know that I will not be posting a schedule for next week, as I will be away on a hiking trip. But when I return, the week starting the 22nd, I shall have a schedule up, and I am looking to fill it hopefully with some collaborations around the VTuber Choir, which I have been organizing this past week. We will be assembling a group of people to all VTubers to sing Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus, and it is looking like it's going to be a very fun project, and I'm looking very much to sharing that process with all of you. Actually, Tuesday night, we had the kind of introductory section for it wherein I recorded some of the learning tracks that we'll be using in that project. So class, I thank you all very much for coming and enjoying some stories tonight. I think three wraps up fairly nicely. Before we look for someone to raid, does anyone have any questions for me?
or should we go ahead and choose someone to raid? If anyone has suggestions on a raid target, please do let me know. If not... Oh, thank you, Kamiana. Very glad that you enjoyed them. My hope is that these are always a nice, relaxing stream where people can come listen to a story. It's very nice being read to, I think. Or at least I enjoy being read to, and I hope you enjoy being read to as well. I certainly enjoy reading to you. Let's see. Of people that are streaming right now. It is nice being read to, and I feel that, you know, as you grow older, it happens less and less. You know, why should that be confined to childhood? It's nice to be read to. It's good sharing stories with other people. How we make connections. Let's see. I can see that Nice Eggy is playing Stardew Valley currently. She is a wonderful singer. Someone who I very much hope I will get to sing with someday. So why don't we go from one relaxing thing to another, from reading to Stardew Valley. And does anyone have a good... Oh no! <laughs> We're being raided by Nice Eggy. Welcome! We were just about to raid you. <laughs> I had just finished up reading stories for the night. Thank you very much for the raid, Nice Eggy. Everyone, if you are not already... Yeah. Let's see. Did I set up the shout-out bot correctly? Let me see. Yes, I did. <laughs> Everyone, if you are not already, do go follow Nice Eggy. She has a wonderful singing voice, plays relaxing games. How was Stardew Valley? I apologize that, uh, Raiders, I have just finished reading for the night. We got through three Sherlock Holmes stories. Ooh, got a duck. That's funny. One of the stories we read tonight involved a goose as its uh, central focus of how a crime was committed. Do check your duck for any stolen jewels hidden inside them. At least that was the case in uh, the case of the blue carbuncle. Let's see. I don't want to do nothing for you raiders. I would feel very bad about that to just turn around and say, let's raid someone else. What can we do that would be short and sweet that wouldn't prolong you all for too long? Does anyone have a very short story I could read? Or would anyone like a song? Oh, swans. Swans will mess you up. I, uh... I make it my habit to steer clear of swans. They can break your wrist. They are very powerful. I do not have any creepypastas saved, unfortunately. See, I'm trying to think if I know any very short stories. You know what? I could just read a few poems. Grab a book of poetry I've got nearby. <laughs> there will be a separate stream for the alto part of Ave Verum Corpus. Don't you worry. You know what? I'll just read a few poems if people like. I've got plenty of books of poetry within range. Let me see, what would be a good one? Get a good one, I'll just grab a random one. Here is Sonnet 37 by William Shakespeare. 
As a decrepit father takes delight to see his active child do deeds of youth, so I, made lame by fortune's dearest spite, take all my comfort of thy worth and truth. For whether beauty, birth, or wealth, or wit, or any of these all, or all, or more, entitled in thy parts do crowned sit, I make my love engrafted to this store. So then I am not lame, or nor despise it, whilst that this shadow doth such substance give that I in thy abundance am sufficed and by a part of all thy glory live. Look what is best, that best I wish in thee. This wish I have, then ten times happy me. Which to put in plainer English, in the same way that a father who's maybe old and no longer fit delights to see their child active running around. So I, the narrator of this poem, Shakespeare, who's been made lame by the spite of bad fortune, takes all of his comfort in thy, your, the subject of this poem, wealth or wit, all these things together in that subject, that love object, sit crowned, you know, adorn this person. And his love is engrafted to the store, tied to it. So then, by virtue of loving this extraordinary person to whom he's written this poem, he's not lame, nor poor, nor despised. And even though this is a shadow, it gives so much substance that the narrator feels abundance to live in part of that person's glory, saying, look, what is best in life? That's what I wish for you. And if this wish comes true, then I will be 10 times the happier. The language of things like Shakespeare might be a little bit archaic. It's still modern English, but earlier modern English. But with just a little parsing of those lines, you find a sentiment that's not foreign at all, you know? It's like saying, for as much as I love you, all of your beauty, your grace, your wit, they elevate me from someone stupid and infirm to the wealthiest man in the world. And if I can wish you all the best in the world, if you get it, I will be 10 times the happier. Very, very romantic notion. Interesting. Do you know which islands those are, Atropa? Okay, I've got one more. Here's an Emily Dickinson poem. We grow accustomed to the dark when light is put away, as when the neighbor holds the lamp to witness her goodbye. A moment. We uncertain step for newness of the night. Then... Fit our vision to the dark, and meet the road, erect. And so of larger darknesses, those evenings of the brain, when not a moon disclose a sign or star come out within, the bravest rope a little, and sometimes hit a tree directly in the forehead. But as they learn to see, either the darkness altered, or something in the sight adjusts itself to midnight, and life steps almost straight. Very simple poem about overcoming adversity. You know, we grow accustomed to the dark when light is put away. Sure, you know, anyone adapts some night vision as they go. You know, turn off all the lights, wait a few minutes, and you'll find your eyes have adjusted. But if we think, you know, metaphorically for a moment, Whenever you step into a new endeavor in life, you know, we uncertain step into that dark, that new night. But as we fit our vision to the dark, we meet that road forward into the uncertain, straight, head on. And when we see those larger darknesses, those evenings of the brain, just a magnificent turn of phrase, when there's no light around us, not by star or moon, the light comes out from within, and the bravest rope a little. You know, we 
even in that complete darkness of the mind, that darkness of the soul, the bravest of us, move just a little bit forward, and maybe you walk straight into a tree. But as you learn to see, either the darkness alters or something alters in the sight. We adjust to midnight, and life steps almost straight. You know, with that bravery, even through the darkest times, things can be almost, almost straight. Actually, here's a very fun thing, class. If you want to forever ruin most Emily Dickinson poetry for yourself, because they are in um, common meter, almost every poem of hers can be fit to one of two... Uh, musical melodies either the gilligan's island theme or the pokemon theme and i'm not kidding here so if i just read a poem here and then sing a bit of it you will understand what i mean success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed to comprehend a nectar requires sorest need not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated, dying, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear. Lovely, right? Now let's ruin it by setting it to the Pokemon theme. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend an actor requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition clear, so clear a victory. So you can... I have just ruined hundreds of poems for you, class. And I feel like with that, we should go and find a raid target. Thank you for indulging me some poetry reading from the nearest uh, assorted volume I had on hand. <laughs> I have enhanced them. Actually, it's a great way. Clip is Alt X or there's a button. It is a great way to memorize a poem, to set it to music. And for that reason, I have several Emily Dickinson poems memorized because once they're in there, they don't, they don't come out. Trust me, I've tried to forget them. It doesn't work. Let's see. Thank you for indulging me that, class. And now let's see who's online that we can raid. Oh, yes. I like Paul's streams. They're very comfortable. Oh, he's playing DJ Max Respect. I greatly enjoy rhythm games, though those, uh, like, Beat Mania-style ones, the, like, DJ Max series, I have never been good at. They're, they have a high learning curve. <laughs> so, class, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you, Eggy, for the raid. I very much appreciate it. And let us go see what Paul is doing. Thank you, class. Have a great night. Hey guys, it's Billy. I am Whoops. here to let you I know. I hit the wrong that button. I hit start preview. I meant um, to hit start music. raid. It features my music and oh, songs now I'm from stuck other in an advertisement. Um, and some Sorry, give me one moment. I am bad at using Twitch. Yeah, I hope I'll have a good hiking trip. It should be uh, quite a lot of fun. Yeah, did I pull up the wrong thing entirely? I think I did. I need to find the stream manager page again. Whoops. Sorry, I may know a lot about poetry and music, but I know very little about using Twitch effectively. Yeah, I'll watch out for big feet. I think the only big feet I'm likely to encounter are me tripping over my own. Hopefully not on a trail actively. We're looking to cover at least 30 miles a day, so... Let's go raid Paul. I don't have a good raid message, so if any of you do, please let me know. Maybe school's out for summer or something.
Let's see. Nine of us ready to raid? Sounds good to me. Let's go pay Paul a visit. Thank you again, class. This song has a pretty good 